Hello, everybody. Oh, hello, everybody. Oh, hello, boys and girls. <laughs> hello, boys and girls. For everyone confused that you can't hear Dan's guitar very well, it's because it's not plugged in. Yeah. Yeah. Are we live then? We are live. How are you all doing? I think we're live. Let's imagine we're live. And a happy and Monday. A, yeah, a ha happy Monday. Let's imagine we're live. Let's imagine the internet is bang on. <laughs> Well, all I'm saying is, on the uh, old screen over there, Daniel, it is saying stream health, not just good, but e excellent. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I heard that before, Mick. Yeah. <laughs> See, now Google Chrome won't open. <laughs> How is everyone? Well, uh, there's some comments coming in over there, so I'm going to go and check over there while Dan entertains you. Okay. Right. Right, here we go. Yeah, loud and clear. We're good? Yeah. Brilliant. Well, it is a season of miracles. <laughs> Brilliant. Why is, why is the Google Chrome thing just bouncing up and down like that then? Uh, it's um, testing your DNA to see what's... Um... Yeah. It's implanting a microchip. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Now it works. Um, welcome. Welcome to VCQ. As you can see, Dan and I are back in the room together. The UK, the English national lockdown ended a few days ago. Yeah. Um, so we're going back to this ridiculous screen. The fewer comments about that, the better, quite Definitely. frankly. Let's see. just rejoice in each other's company and um, have a jolly old time. <laughs> a jolly old sing song. <laughs> what a jolly sing song. I am a little bit confused why you wore the blue T-shirt today, Dan. Blue T-shirt? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, because there's Candy Dan and Sonic Mick. I didn't... Uh, look, the first thing I heard about Candy Dan and Sonic Mick was when I walked through and Catherine says, oh, you 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 got Mick's shirt on. And I was like, no, this is my shirt. Because I, I got it. And she said, no, you've got Candy Dan... Is it Candid Dan or Candy Dan? Candy. Candy Dan and Sonic Mick. Yeah. And I thought, oh, right. I just thought it was cool. So you put mine on and I've got yours on. Yeah. That's, that's love. It's because we're friends. That's love. That's sharing is caring. <laughs> I'm slowly, slowly trying to sign in. If I can remember the flipping password. Oh, oh man. Oh no. Boy, oh boy. Okay. Yeah. Dan and I have been doing some harmonious monk stuff today. So the harmonious monk signature pedal is going to come out next week. They're almost finished building them. Uh, and they're going to be on sale at that pedal show store next Friday. We could show you the picture of it on the board. However, the. Um Pedal cam's broken. Pe pedal cam has gone a lovely shade of, we don't know what. It's a puce. Here comes Bevers. Sorry, chaps. Um, have you got the printout from last week's super chats? Uh, I don't. It's out there somewhere. Bless but you. I can. I think I can see them from a screen on here. Okay. Yeah. If you can't, shout. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah. Here's the harmonious monk. Here it is. Look at that. Mm. It's so nice. So yeah, coming out next Friday. Right, we're going to start. Well, let's 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 get on. Okay. Um, last week we had to abandon um, VCQ because the internet decided it didn't want to work. It was Cyber Monday. Whether that had anything to do with it or not, we don't know. So we're going to pick up from last week and um, answer the super chats that we missed last yes. week. With apologies to everyone um, that we missed. God, this is terrible, isn't it? We'd never get a job on TV. No. Literally no. never. But then, when you work in a TV studio, they have assistants and stuff running around, plugging stuff in. Yeah. Making sure it doesn't work. I've spent, I've spent five minutes just trying to get on Wi-Fi. Making sure it doesn't work. They... Yeah. 
<laughs> wow. Wow. So is everyone good? I hope everyone's awesome. Um, okay, roll call. Phila from uh, Manhattan, NYC. Uh, Michael Kovarik. Uh, hi from Germany. Oh, do you remember we had a, an email from um, a gentleman? Actually, the same. So, a gentleman in Germany, his first name is, was E W. So, U W E. Uwe. It's, it's actually Uwe. Oh, Uwe. Uwe. Uwe Malmstein. Uwe Malmstein. <laughs> um, Mark Lavinish, hello from Denver, Colorado. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Uwe, 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 Uwe. Uwe, 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 no. La, 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 la. I like la, that. La. I like that. So I'm not quite sure how far these go back. Oh, there we go. Right. Chris Barrett. Let's start with you, Chris Barrett, if you're watching. Hi from Danbury, Connecticut. I've started to develop some pain in the index finger of my fretting hand. Ooh. Uh, that makes playing a challenge. What are your thoughts? This is interesting. I've developed a wrist injury, mm. um, which is probably some sort of RSI. Any thoughts, Dan? I've never had anything like this before. Uh, yeah. Ice and heat. Alternate those. Stretch. You know, warm up. Warm up your hands before you start. Yeah. You know, really important. I, I remember I was um, with my friend. Uh, I was actually about to join a band and they were supporting status quo in Sydney and we were backstage and all the boys in status quo had their um, fitness instructor they're all stretching yeah. and stuff before the gigs and they're like man it's you know it's like we're young again it does get really boring um, I don't know how old you are but um, Chris it is boring uh, I'm definitely start I'm 47 in March and bits of my body are stopping working mm. but not not because that it's not necessarily an age thing my physio says it's nothing to do with age necessarily it's the fact you're just not active enough anymore yeah so I'm not it's not the years it's the miles baby <laughs> very possibly are we loud enough I'm, I'm seeing that we're only going up into the yellow Dan okay you know I'm not happy unless we're no of course of course let's try this there's a little bit more a little bit more a little bit um, more welly for you. Um, right. John Newquist. Hi, John, and thank you. Hey, John. Cheers to the whole crew uh, from your patron at Wound Third Studios in Cotati Hills, Sonoma County. Um, here's a little tip just because. Uh. I've bought so much great gear during lockdown, thanks in part to you guys. Thank you, John. Um, I think lots of people have bought lots of stuff during lockdown, haven't they? Yes. Man alive. Yeah. I was talking to my mate Paul yesterday, who I played in bands with for years, bass player, awesome bass player, um, who then went on to run a push bike shop. Oh, wow. And he phones me up and he's like, I'm thinking to buy a custom shop strap. I'm like, right, you bored? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Cole Eustason, Cole Eustason or Justason says... I love your show. I have a Hughes and Kettner Pure Tone and would like to know which pedals were your favourite with that amp. Mm. Can either of you recall them for gain, reverb and delay? It's interesting because it's a, it's, it is an absolutely incredible amp, but it's not forgiving. No, it's, it, for all intents and purposes, it's a plexi. Yeah. It's a plexi sort of, I don't know, it's a visceral plexi. It really it's is It's a plexi on the edge. Yeah. It's a plexi on the edge, man! So same rules apply, really, with pedals that work with really visceral, martial-style amps. Um, I always thought it took pedals really well. The only the, the caveat is once it starts hairing up a bit, if, you, if yeah. you're insane enough to run it gainy, because it's so cr incredibly loud. It's crazy loud, that thing. Yeah, or at least its, it's attack is... It, it's sort of loud by about 0.5 on the volume control and, control, and then it gets louder to about 1.5, and then it just gets more distorted. Yeah. So the challenge you've got into a gainy amp is if you run reverb and delay in the front, it can sound a bit scratchy and nasty. Mm. Um, and in my personal experience, using analog stuff really helps there. So an analog delay, not many analog reverbs about. Um, uh, spring reverbs, yeah, white whale and and that sort of stuff. There's yeah, that stuff works really well. But certainly something that doesn't have a lot of high end in the repeats and rolls off a bit of tone, so that you don't get all that. Mm. But gain pedals, pretty much anything. Yeah, anything that works into a plexi. Yeah. Just, 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 you know, as we always talk about with gain stages and being aware of the the EQ and stuff. And so, 
you know that thing has got is very quick it's got loads of mids um, so you know maybe uh, as a you know if you're running it gainy maybe a tube screen or a recline if you're running it clean which would suggest with some pedals in the front you know some full frequency ODs stuff yeah there we go yeah. uh, Doug Poligano Gan Gananano Polignano Polignano Gananano 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 No 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 absolutely not He says Mick did you ever get around to weighing your strat I'm curious to know the weight since you prefer lighter weight strats Uh yeah I do in general mine's not not as light as some of the ones I've played Dan and my guitars are pretty much exactly the same weight which is yeah. kind of interesting which I think didn't we say 3.5 kilos yeah, the weight of legend, something, something like that. I, I can't know. remember. Um, in terms of my strats, it's not as heavy as the John Mayer strat. It's about the same as the old one, actually, the sixty-one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not as light as Transit Van. Transit Van's the lightest. Yeah. So yeah, sorry, don't know the exact figure. Uh, Caleb Graham, hi Caleb. Thanks, fellas, uh, for keeping me entertained as I deliver everyone's packages. Ah. Oh. Uh, and thank you, blimey, what would we do without you guys, delivery Man. drivers, flipping heck, what a what a stoic bit of work you guys have put in, you yep. guys and girls have put in um, over this period. Uh, he says, have you got any tips for making a dual tiered hinged pedal board like the Schmidt Array? Uh, it's a bit of engineering, the Schmidt Array. Yep. So what's inside is a load of really lovely, super high quality stainless steel fittings. And everything is machined very, very carefully to fit just so. So what I would do is make the box, sides and back, base plate, get some sort of hinge arrangement to fit inside and then cut the shelves to fit inside. I think you, I mean, if you're handy with uh, wood, and tools, yes. you could do a pretty good job of that. I would you thought. could just be just be exacting with your measurements as well. Yeah. I'd say because they, it, a few mil either way, and and the pedals won't fit or there'd be too much space and you yeah. know ergonomically. But I would think if you if you had sides, front and back, and a tray in the bottom, and you made that as a sort of carcass, um, then you put your fittings inside for your shelves, and then some sort of lid that you yeah. could just use any any if you closing. If for. you search the internet, people have done. Videos on, on, on homemade two-tier pedal boards and stuff. And there's yeah. some good stuff out there. Yeah, yep. for sure. Yep. Uh, Matt. Hi, Matt. And sorry we missed you. Um, have you ever experimented... Matt Lloyd, this is. Sorry. Uh, have you ever experimented with pickups staggered for a left-handed guitar? I decided to try it because that's what Hendrix would have experienced. I put them in my Strat Tune to E-flat and there is a difference. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about that. I mean, no. so there's two types of staggering, right? One is the stagger of the magnets. And I'm not... Sh Did Fender ever make left-handed pickups? Or were they just right-handed pickups but in a left-handed guitar? He never played a left-handed guitar there, did he? It was just a right-handed guitar upside down. Yeah, so the pickups would have been the same. They just would have been upside down. Yeah, and he didn't, he didn't, he didn't play uh, the same way that... Um, uh, you know, he, he, he strung his guitar left-handed... So the so the, the E the, yeah. the, would have been you know the low E would have been there yeah. high E there yeah so <laughs> this is going to be a spatial awareness hilarity fest is that just the same as taking the pickup out and turning it upside down then possibly uh yeah but then you change the phase the magnetic phase of stuff as well so okay uh, so that's one kind of stagger how the pole pieces are staggered the other stagger is um, obviously on a strap the the bridge pickup tilts back towards the bridge and if you turn the guitar upside down then the pickups tilted the other way I uh, that that's always made sense to me because if you think about the like okay it's going to make a massive difference it does make a massive difference and I've always thought that it should be like that because uh, with the thinner strings there's more the vibration there's more energy the closer to the middle that you get yeah so, so it would be a th faster less, sound yeah well it's just more even I would have thought more balanced but um that's what we've got. Yeah, and remember what amps were back in the pre-Hendrix time, but when they decided to angle the pickup in this guitar and also in the Strat, you know, you're talking about small, not very powerful amps that crapped out in the bass really badly. Yep. Um, which makes it even more strange that it's angled that way. 
Um, I had a I had that around that way around in my Hendrix. Well, actually, it's not a Hendrix strap. My reverse headstock strap yeah. because it came with it with the sort of pickup angle back the other way, and um, I think it sounded pretty good. But I just couldn't look at it, so I uh, I swapped it out. <laughs> I swapped it out. Um, Maniacal Lion, thanks for being with us again. Hey, hey good doing? sirs. Thoughts on a working musician's challenge? We aren't rich, but we do invest in our passion. 3K to make a rig you could gig and record with. Oh, that's very doable. Yeah, there's a actually there's a 15 minute pedal board challenge coming up in a couple of weeks where Dan and I got 15 minutes to throw four pedals on a board, choose an amp and get to the gig. Oh, that was hilarious. Um, we, we had all kinds of technical comedy throughout it, so whether it actually makes it out or not, I don't know. But um, and and trying to play songs without without breaching copyright. Yeah, brilliant. That was great. So, um, but yeah, that's a really good shout. Actually, I think a lot of people would probably be quite offended by the three K tag. But does that include guitars and amps? Um, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of people would regard that as a crazy amount of money. I could just take the neck on this to a gig and yeah. tap it next there's to the microphone. Three, there's your 3K. Yeah, I think that's a good shout. Okay. Um, we we don't tend to like doing things that are purely based on price for the reason that everyone's budget is different. Yeah. And I th what would be more interesting is a price weighting. So if you've got guitar, pedals, and amp, how much of your budget proportionally do you throw at the guitar, the pedals? That's and the amp. very interesting. Okay, that could be quite interesting. Yeah, because okay. I've always thought money on the amp is where you should spend your money. Yeah, like any old blue plank will do, won't it? Pretty much. If you play Fenders. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Right. Um, right. Still catching up. Still catching up. Okay. We're, we're going to be a long way behind today. Uh, Nag Anud. Nag Anud says. I struggle to find delay settings that are out of the way, but still noticeable enough to justify the pedal on my board. Am I missing something fundamental about this beloved effect? Um, yeah, so... I love this question. There's a, okay, it depends a lot on the amp that you're going into, and if it has the headroom and the clarity to faithfully reproduce what's going on in the pedal. So, for example, if you if you've got an amp that's you know compressing and everything, then even the quieter delay sounds will, will sound loud. And when you get to a, to you turn down the effect level to a point where it's not in the way, it's basically off. So, but if you've got a nice clean amp, the the trick is it's not just with the top end. The trick is with the repeats is the bottom end as well. So, you can have a lovely big fat lush delay but if it's if it's got too much bottom in the repeats it will it will foul things up just like having too much top um, also experiment with your delay times if you've got a nice you know the reason a lot of people like analog delays is because the a lot of the time the EQ on the repeats is perfect it does that filter thing on the on the bottom end, the um, you know because of the the nature of the delay it doesn't have all the top end sibilance, and so they work really well. Um, but what can also work really well if you've got like a, just a clean digital delay, try longer repeats like really long, and that can just be in the background. It creates this wash, um, which can be really nice, like a um, a an, an alternative to reverb. Um, yeah, but it depends on a number of things. The, the, the amplifier, of course, the sort of delay that you're using. Um, but we've done a show on on ten different ways to use delay. Check it out because we go through a lot of that stuff in detail in that show. Yeah, it is true to say that reverbs and delays get uh, lost in mixes. But if you listen to some of your favourite records, you'll hear. And if you've got decent monitoring headphones, or you, you know, you're in a mood to listen loud and critically, you'll hear reverbs and delays you've never heard before. Yeah. And it's not necessarily that they're there to the point where you know it's a delay, but when you take them away, boy, do you notice it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the great... Um, people who are really good at mixing, producing in general, and this goes for live sound too, 
to work those reverbs and delays in there, which gives everything like a cushion and a pad and makes it all sound f together and full. Mm -hmm. But it's really not till you turn them off that you notice them. So, yeah. I, so it could be that you're not noticing them in the mix. If you play for a bit, you know, play for a few minutes and then turn it off, I think that's when you'd really notice it. That's personally how I like to use reverbs and delays. Sure. So they're kind of, they're like this cloud that you sit on. That you, and then after a while you forget you're sitting on the cloud. Yep. So you turn it off, it's like, ooh. Hi, oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Essa Hakarainen. Essa Hakarainen. Who may be of some kind of uh, Scandinavian descent, I would say. Although it looks like lives in the US. Essa says, hi from Tacoma. Uh, Washington State, I guess that is. Is it Tacoma? WA? Washington? Uh, WA will be Washington, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've just spent three days in the studio with my project Sweet Creature Signal Chains, and I think you'd be proud of us including wet, dry, wet, dry, wet. Yeah, man. <laughs> Some utilising DI to desk and tape. Managed to use all 45 of my pedals. Oh, my God. Legend. Well awesome. done. But it sounds massive. Uh, what's your opinion on GNL? Says Jan Krakowiak. Fabulous. Um, or Krakowiak, I apologise, I don't know how to pronounce your name. The Espada is Tele 2.0. Um, yeah, so obviously for anyone who doesn't know, when Leo Fender left Fender, he did Music Man. And then after Music Man, he did G&L with George Fullerton, interestingly enough, who was an old mucker at Fender, George and Leo, G&L. Um, and sort of took... Because he was always looking forwards, right? The yep, offender. always. So he took what the, the, the improvements that he wanted to make and did GNL guitars. I have had two GNL guitars over the years, three in fact. Uh, I had a red ASAT special, which was my main gigging guitar for a couple of years there. I had a B Bender classic, which I wow. so regret having to sell. Thank you, Financial Crash of uh, 2007. 2008. 2008. 2008. Um, and yeah, great guitars. There's a couple of things I don't dig about GNLs. You don't dig the finish? Personally, the finish, very thick polyester finish on mm -hmm. them. Some of them, they do do nitro as well. And on all mine, the necks are really thin. Oh, really? Yeah. We had one here for a while. It sounded great. It's in a case down there. Okay. We have one here. Yeah. And it's... um. It's really funny. I remember taking it out of the case and it had the thick poly and stuff, and the like the ceramic pickups and all that stuff, and the two point bridge. Plugged it in, magic. Yeah, it's a great sounding guitar. I, I yeah, really really like them, um, but not enough to own one over uh, overly yeah, strats and sure. stuff. Um, Sean Walker says, uh, Mick, I recently purchased a used Bellow Epoch Deluxe. And I'm having trouble with the expression pedal. I got a Dunlop X Mini. The volume comes in at full. There's no swell and there's a nasty pop. Have you had this issue? Yes. Right. Inside the Dunlop Mini X are two dip switches or two little slider switches. And you've just got to make sure that they're in the correct configuration to do what you want it to do mm -hmm. on the Bell Epop Deluxe. So take the bottom off the Dunlop Mini X, plug it in. It will turn your amp down quiet because it will pop and hiss and do loads of stuff you don't really want. But you'll find a combination of those switches that means it will work perfectly. Yeah. And also make sure you're using a TRS cable. Oh, nice. Yeah. TRS for um, tomatoes. Uh, Rhubarb. Ratatouille <laughs> and sausage. Very good. Yeah. Um, Mick, says Mark Baziniski. Mark Baziniski. Um Hi Mick, did you ever get Ron Ellis humbuckers for your 335? I didn't, no. Uh, I had a little bit of a childish wig out because Gibson was throwing its lawyers around again and decided I didn't want my 335 anymore. And then I kind of gave up on that. Although they've been doing it again this week. Have they? they? Yeah, satellite amps. I get it. You've got to protect your trademarks, haven't you? Yeah, sure. But even so, even so. Um, so I didn't. I told Ron not to send me any, and um, but I may pick that up again. I may pick that up again when the gold top's got to go back. Uh, I've got a gold top that I'm borrowing at the moment. Uh, 
which is just about the best Gibson guitar I've ever had in my possession. Mm. In fact, it is the best Gibson guitar I've ever had in my possession, so I'm addicted to it. Unfortunately, I can't afford to buy it, uh, not least that it's not for sale. But um, So when it goes Crazy. back... It would be really serious cash. They're they? like nearly 10 grand, I think. Oh, my word. You know, for a new guitar, for a new Gibson. Yeah. Well, anyway, so that I'm not playing the 335 much. However, this Friday show... Les Paul versus 335. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Right, Dan, question for you. Brian Paul says, hi, guys, hope you're well. Question for Dan. With G3, can I use two stereo pedals that only have mono inputs in parallel loops? Two stereo <sighs> pedals okay. that only have mono inputs in I, parallel I, loops. Yeah, so... You, what you want to do is have two stereo pedals basically in parallel fed from uh, a mono signal. Uh, it is possible, but not yet. There's a software update that will come that will sort that out. Um, so it, it you will be able to have two mono inputs into two stereo and the stereo outputs are fed in parallel. Obviously, you can't um, feed them into each other because, you've, I mean, I guess... Anyway, we w we will be doing a software update to allow you to do that. No, to do that. I've got a stereo mono question about the CXM nineteen seventy eight. Okay. Can you run it in mono? Yeah. Can you? Totally. Oh, it doesn't say you can anywhere. I mean, it's designed to run a stereo, but you can totally run it in mono. Left out. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, Richard Chester uh, didn't have a question, but thank you for your generosity, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Harold Reed. Oh no, Michael Plumridge. Hi, Michael. He says. Hey guys, I'm thinking about picking up my first tube amp. Should I go head or combo format? I think I will go with the Fender Supersonic. Fender Supersonic's a really good shout. It's a, you know, great app for your first app. It's, it's a big deal. Yeah, they, well, they don't do the 100 anymore, so it'll be the 22. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. I don't think they do great. the 100 anymore. Yeah. Um, it's a really interesting question, that. I, I think Dan and I have gravitated towards heads and cabs over mm. the years, just through the luxury of being able to have lots of cabs and having somewhere to store them. And somewhere to use them. Yeah. But... Yeah, it's a really tough one, actually. Mm. I would let fate decide. Oh, no, because if you're going to buy it new, you can just you can make your choice. Um, it's tricky. I... I'd probably go with the combo. Yeah. Because then, the first... then you take away the all that hassle of what cab to buy and everything. Yeah. I would I would agree. If it's your first valve amp, just the combo would sound amazing. You can still use it with an extension kit with extension cab, but yeah. Unless you go into the shop and they've got a head and cab there, they sound awesome, and you think, "Yeah, I'll have." Yeah, that. yeah. You're obviously leaning one way, Michael. Go, yeah. go with the way the way you're yeah, yeah. leaning. Agreed. Agreed. Um, Harold Reed, I'm still looking for the optimum placement of the wetter box on my board. I thought it would be best with my ARDX20 and Delay Llama, but I'm not sure that's the best use. Okay. It's up to you, Harold. You just so Harold. You can use that thing in a thousand different ways. Your job is to experiment and find the thing that you like. Uh, you know, the great thing about a box like that is that you can just plug anything into it and have a play. Um, you know, those two delays are amazing. You can have them one on each side and have them run in parallel. Awesome, uh, but they. You know, they're, they're really amazing analog delays with great analog dry through. Um, so, yeah, experiment. Experiment with a bunch of stuff that you, you know, put in the one side and, you know, blend in a, a dry signal or blend in your gain signal or, you know, just experiment. Because it's going to be different for everyone. There's yeah. no optimum place for it. It's completely dependent on you. Yeah, you've got to know what you want to do with it, haven't you? Yeah, I think. and just have a play. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about an echo fix, says Mike Bilson. Hi, yes. Mike. He's in the UK. Um, I'm concerned about warranty and repair work and where this could be done. Also, what about reliability, tape life and tape, tape, tape availability? Please put my right mind at rest. OK, so Shane uh, from Echo Fix developed this after fixing hundreds and hundreds of tape machines. 
So it's designed to be reliable. And this one has been, you know, used it with every gig that we've done. It's unreal. Um, I would say that, yeah, chain is in Australia and any, you know, getting, if you do break it and needs to be sorted out, um, that, yeah, it'll probably need a trip back to Australia. However, um, chain to deal with is fantastic and he will look after you. Surely is, anyone who can service tape echoes could service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's made to made to be serviceable. Yeah. So if you you know if you need to get the heads cleaned or whatever, um, as opposed to like if it breaks, you know what I mean. But it's not designed to break. It's designed to be great, and it is really fantastic. Um, you know, it's an you know wonderful artisan made piece of gear. Could, I would have if you're in the in the thing in the market for a proper tape machine. You wanted a new one. I would have no hesitation to do that. No hesitation it, at it all. It might be worth just googling around who can fix tape machines in your locale, wherever you might be, and give them a call and say, "Look, if I got one of these, can you deal with it?" Yep. Um, you know, there's enough space echoes and all that kind of stuff out there still being used and serviced that mm -hmm. there's people out there that can do it. So I'm sure you'll be Sound able to find guess. somebody. Yeah. Also, um, ask Shane. Uh, yeah, totally. What his uh, arrangement in the UK is, because he will almost yeah. certainly have one. Yep. Um, la, 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 la. Justin Balog. Hi, Justin. He says, how do you handle wet-dry using an FX loop? I'm splitting the FX signal. Dry goes to my amp. Wet goes to time-based effects and a Mesa 5050 stereo. Right. So if I run pedals with kill dry, I can't run multiple effects if I bypass the first one. Then you're into a different thing. So, right, you want to use the gain tone from your amplifier. What you would do is split the signal actually from the effects loop. So instead of uh, just having an effects send and return, you put your splitter in the effects loop and then you take that out into the mono input of the first stereo effect. Stereo out into left and right of the power amplifier. So you're actually getting your gain from the preamp of your main amplifier. That's a great way to do it. Um, you know, there are, yeah, there are lots of different ways to do it, but that's that will work really well. What? Um, so if you, Presumably, if you want to use the kill dry function for your wet, and you've got, let's say, you've got a reverb and delay that you want to use the kill dry in, mm. then you have to get those away from the dry amp. So you have to use some sort of splitter. So you can send your, if you use the Humdinger, for example, you can go straight to your dry amp. Yes, but what it's saying and then is that only you, have, yeah, but you, you because. Uh, he's using the gain from the amplifier, yeah. from the amplifier's preamp. So you've got to split after the preamp. Oh, so I the see. easiest thing is just to put the humdinger in the effects loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then take the signal from that into the stereo effects, left and right out, bang, happy days. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, right, Matthew Phillips. Hi, Matthew. Um, he says, hi, guys. I took the leap and built a wet-dry rig for the first time. I paired a Fender Supersonic 22 with my AC15 dry. Absolute revelation. Thanks for the amazing advice and keeping awesome. me sane in 2020. Yeah, Dan and I have been having a bit of a wet dry um, <sighs> moment today using the Harmonious Monk. I wish we could show you the board. It's just insane. Yeah, the, the something wrong with the pedal board camera, unfortunately. Um, yeah, um, we've got the uh, the two tomato tones. We've got the um, the preamp Mark II and the CXM 1978. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you anyway. You have to forgive the colour because there's something definitely wrong with this. But um. yeah, just imagine that um, uh, everything's blue. Yeah, imagine everything isn't blue. Uh, look at the rock come this way. No, no. the other way. Ugh. What you should do, what you should always do, is move a table with loads of drinks and a really expensive pedal board on it. That's what you should do. Anyway, have a look at this then. Ah, oh, man. Let's have a look at the focus, shall we, Dan? Go for it. 
Yeah, so we're running the um, the Harmonious Monk wet dry. Just in, you know, the it's feeding one side of the reverb. Oh man, it's just delicious. It is, and I have literally no idea why why it's that colour. Yeah, it's not it's not yellow, it's blue, but yeah. there's just the yeah, that thing is being strange. Yeah, there's something wrong with the um, uh, SDI out on that on that camera. Here's what it actually looks like. Ah, well, I put it put it here. There you go. It's blue. It's blue. Anyway. Anyway. Quite, quite the pedal board. Um. Hello from Orlando, says Brad. Oh, I love Orlando. I haven't been following for some time. Been feeling a bit uninspired. Yeah, you and me both, Brad. Uh, but I'm glad to be back. Hopefully an early Christmas present. Uh, the V40, the Duchess, with a wide cab will do the trick. Mm. Thanks for your hard work during these hard times. Yeah. Man, I've, I've found that just the, the stress of 2020, the first thing that went was my musical inspiration. Yeah. It's just like, no. You know, so I've kept doing the work, but the, those moments of being inspired have been few and far between. Yeah, it's the cumulative sort of feeling, isn't it? Mm. Don't want to bring anyone down, but that kind of... I think you just, you carry on and you carry on and you carry on and you just sort of ignore it and put it to the back of your mind. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh God, I'm really bored of this. I loved the first lockdown. Yeah, I remember. Absolutely loved it. You are in your element. Yeah, but the second one, whoa, Yeah, that so was tough. Very tough. Um, anyway, we hope you're doing all right, Brad. Yeah, Brad. Um, and good luck with that V40. Yeah, mate. Jonathan Doolin, or Dullin, says, where do you personally run your chorus in your effects chain? Mm. Um, I, I use it... I guess chorus, I normally would have before my delay, because um, I only ever really use it I use flanger with dirty stuff, so the flanger would go in the front. Chorus, I use cleaner, so I have it uh, after a boost, before a delay, generally. Yeah, I, I always run it post-gain. Yeah. Uh, part of the reason for that is that um, usually run wet-dry, so it has to come after gain. Sure. Because you have to split it after that. Some people much prefer their chorus pre-gain. Yeah. So do it both ways and see which, which you like best. Yep. Yep. Um, Jeremy Randall and Snowblind really like our new shirts, Dan. Oh, do they? Yeah. Shall I check them out? In case you haven't seen it, look. It's a reverb it's tank. It's a reverb tank. Look at that. The pedal show on it. it and then this is this colour is it's called Candy Dan. And that colour is called Sonic Mick. And they are available from that pedal show store right now. It's anatomically correct. <laughs> if, you, if you took inside my, my guts, that's what you'd see. <laughs> The video quality is great, says Corey Nichols. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, Corey. That's the um, Sony A7S III. It is a staggeringly good small camera. Are we in autofocus focus mode? Uh, you I think I turned the autofocus mode off. I thought I saw you doing... No. no. Yeah, I turned it off. Okay. Uh, um, but it's got great autofocus. Um, yeah, so that's good. Um, right. Steve Rideout says, here's a small token of thanks for the lack of mid-roll ads. <laughs> In the comments, I often see folks asking for thoughts on the Dodd looking glass. If so, um, uh. have you any thoughts on it? Yeah. Uh, we remember. We remember. So we were at NAMM when they demoed it, and it was absolutely superb. And Ford we, Thurston. Yeah. Ah oh, man. He is such a killer guitar player. He may... Ah, oh, Yeah. But we tried really hard to get one for the longest time. Yeah, we didn't get and one. We, did just, we? we should we, just buy one. Yeah. It's really good. I've got a question about that. I would like to know what the input impedance of that pedal is. Okay, I bet, I, okay I'm betting it's quite low. Yes, because? Because of the dynamic response to the volume control. I want to know if there is a, a correlation, mm. if that is always the case. Uh, well, yeah, it can be. Yeah. Um, shout out to BV for moderating, as BV. always. BV, thank you so much for doing that for us. Thank you, mate. It's a big deal. Thank Very you. kind. Um, and Steve, uh, mid-roll, yeah, f f uh, really sorry to everyone. Google, as they do, went, we're changing things. Boom, changed. I mean, in actual fact, they emailed us like 28 days before. Right. But it was one of the 3,000 unread emails in my inbox, so 
I managed not to read it. Um, and they just turned on like mid-roll ads for everything. And some of the videos were getting ads every two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we had to pay Fraser to manually go through and t every yeah, yeah, yeah. single old video yeah. <laughs> and turn them off. Yeah. Um, Paul Rasmussen. Um, no question from you, Paul. Maybe there's one somewhere else, but thank you for your generosity. Airfire says, Mick, did you ever get more familiar with the MXR clone looper? I've decided I want a looper to level up my lead lines. Can't decide between the MXR, TC Ditto or Boss RC3 for a beginner. Um, for a beginner, the TC Ditto Mini, the, just the basic Ditto. Mm -hmm. Now we're good. Should we do a bit of auto focus, Dan? Go on then. Should we have some fun? We've got the new one as well, the new Ditto. The what? Floating around somewhere. The new what? The new Ditto. It's got a screen. Really? Yeah. Well, I have to cover up Dan's face, otherwise it will look for him, you see. There's the MXR clone looper. I think I love that thing. Yeah, me too. It's my favourite one. Yeah. I also think it sounds really great. Um, That's Ditto, the simplest. Super simple. So crazy simple. I actually find stopping and starting this one easier than this one. Mm. I don't know why that is. I'm not very good at looping, is the truth. Um, I'd get this one, personally. Yeah, I like that one. Because it does a couple of cool things as well. Um, as for the boss ones, I mean, they are as close to industry standard as it's possible to get, but I'm damn sure I can't work out how to turn it on and off. The, the, the RC10... Any of them. I've used the RC3 for years. That's got one switch, the, the Ditto, and yeah. it's really obvious w yeah. what happens. I've used the RC3 for years. Great. But even after using the RC3 for years, I cannot work the RC10. So I've got to get into, you know, I have to work out a way to use yeah. it. Yeah, I would say, um, a potentially contentious statement, I think the MXR sounds better than the TC. Okay. The MXR one does sound really good. Yeah. Uh, John Newquist says, Hello, happy to have you back. And we're very happy that you're here, John. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, greetings from Wound Third Studio in Cotati, Sonoma County. Ah. Everyone check out Wound Third Studios. I like that. Like it's a statement of intent, isn't it? Well, having a round third, it's yeah, a bit, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no questions, just big love, and right back to you, John. Oh, thank, thank you, John. That's very kind. Um, yeah, my jazz box has got a round third in it. I need to get some flat rounds for that, actually. Anyway, sorry, I'm meandering. I'm getting to that age. Yeah. So talking of getting to that age, Dan and I are going to bring back the old dudes for a Christmas special. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't watched our Christmas special from about four years ago, please watch it, because uh, the old dudes are going to come out again. Gents, says Vibas Patil. Hello, Vibas. Hello, Thanks Vibas. for being with us, as always. Can you please share advice on syncing audio and video, getting a good sound and mixing when it comes to holding a virtual live concert? What software, hardware, and other equipment would be needed? Oh, man, this... That is a question that would take us a week to answer. Yeah. We've done two months of getting it wrong, three months of really struggling. To, to try and be as simplistic as possible, you need something doing your audio. Mm -hmm. So whether that is a mixing desk, some sort of virtual mixing desk, like we use the um, Universal Audio console. But personally, if you're going to be mixing a band, I'd want sliders. So you mix the audio in a desk, you send that out into whatever you're going to use to stream with, right? We use a Blackmagic ATEM Mini Pro, which is immeasurably better than the ATEM Mini. So right. the Mini Pro's got its own hardware encoder in it for streaming. We were having all sorts of trouble before. Yes, then right. into that, you plug your cameras. Depending on the processor speed of the camera that will determine how fast it spits the hdmi out mm -hmm. so it might be at least that's a constant that you'll know so you might have to delay by a frame or two which the black magic allows you to do and then you just up and then you stream direct from that atem mini pro to youtube it, it's massively improved our workflow yeah having that machine rather than having to have some software encoder or another hardware encoder so mm. sorry to to summarize that cameras there's one there, there's one there, and then you can plug in up to four. 
HDMI out, they go into the Mini Pro. Whatever you're using to mix the audio goes into the Mini Pro. Mini Pro. Then you can do some tests using a clapper board to let you know whether you're in sync or not. And you'll, you should only be a frame or two out, mm. sometimes three frames. Right. And the software in the ATEM Mini will enable you to delay whatever is needs delaying. Mm. Good luck, because it's painful and expensive. It is. Yep. It is. Uh, Luis Enrique Machado. Hi, Luis. He says... Is that, is that Bra Brazilian? Uh, anyway. He's in Europe. He's in Europe, I think. Okay. So maybe he's... Luis Enrique. Maybe he's in Spain. Um, he says, Hope you guys are doing great. Sunface BC183 being silicon... Could it be placed after a non-true bypass TS9? I'm not planning on using them together. Uh, I would, I'd definitely place it before. If you're not planning on using them together, yeah. place it before the TS9. Exactly. After. If you're not going to use them together, put it before if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, but you're right to suggest that um, some uh, silicon fuzzes are less sensitive. The good news about the sun face is that it's got a couple of trimmers in it. Mm. And Mike's, son, Mike's fuzz face type things just seem to sit better on pedal boards than others. Yeah. There's certainly classic fuzz faces anyway. Yeah, yeah. But the, the other thing is, if you like the sound of the buffer on the input, go with it. But I would, tr you've got to try it both ways. I think you'll end up with the sun face before. Yeah. Um, I'm antisocial, says. I'm getting a volume drop with the DC2 in the effects loop. What's the best fix? DC2 Wazza dimension. Okay, is the I, is the wiser line level? Well, I tell you, I had a problem with it when I put it on the end of my board. Do you remember? Yes, I remember. It just now. couldn't take no the the the, the lunars. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. If you really, really want it in the loop, then you'll need to get some sort of. Um, there are devices that will enable you to send the signal out, reduce the level, and then uh, re-amplify the level on the way back in. That's a faff. I would try it. I, yeah, man, I would try it before the preamp. But yeah, there are like dumbbellator type things that you can do. I think um, uh, Mason did a video with one, using one with effects loop. It's really, there's a, Really clever. Yeah, two rock make one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a there's a bunch of them out there. Yeah. Um, that allow you to sand out from the line level effect, reduce it for a, a normal instrument level, and then recover that signal going back in. I've always struggled with them, but the new ones are apparently really good, so I'm going to try some out. Yeah. So what we're saying is, the best place for DC two is really not in your effects loop. So if you can get it before. Yeah. Um, get it before the front of the amp might work a bit better. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, Scott Armour says, Great to see you both back in the room. I'm sitting at home recovering from a broken hip. Ah, I have a few weeks, so I'll try and get back into playing guitar. Scott, broken hip, that sounds really bloody painful. <laughs> we hope you're doing all right. Man, I remember when um, Dougie, uh, our drummer, he had to have a hip replacement. And I think from the years of of playing with me standing up but has basically had to stand on one foot and then use it and use the kick drum but the gig that we did he was standing up playing drums and we did that for years and years and years it got to a point where he needed a hip replacement playing drums wow so you broke dougie's hip i did i didn't you know not intentionally howdy Just howdy that. howdy says georgian's jordan scarpelli hello Van vancouver says calm the monster uh, mark hill says hello from scotland on a scale of 10 to 11 how excited are you for the Boss Tone Bender? Oh, man, that's going to be... Oh, yes, very excited. Uh, I'm not. Okay. Why isn't it a Mark I? Why isn't I'm, it a Mark II? How I'm, many Mark IIs are there out there? Sure. I'm, I'm ex I'll tell you why I'm excited. Because it's the first time I've known Boss do something like this. I'm excited to see what they've done with it. I really like that vo the, um, the voltage selector on top. That's really interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to see their take on it. That's just me. 
Um, Axel Conradson says, any comment on amp simulator pedals like the Fox Gear Genie to practice quietly without a computer? Yes. I've been using the Iconoclast from uh, New Neighbor recently. We've been doing a bunch of testing for G3. So myself uh, and Jake and Joe from Gig Rig were sat in an office for three weeks, eight hours a day, testing everything. We use the Iconoclast, which is really interesting. Stereo in, stereo out. Yeah, yeah. Zero latency. Really? Yeah, well, they've, they've done it differently. They've, they've used a different sort of process or something, but it's it's not a modeling thing per se. Right. Um, and it is fantastic. New neighbor Iconoclast. Yeah, tr try that. Yep. It sounds really great. Great, very powerful EQ, really, really clever. Right, David Locke, we're going to answer this really quickly because this is a quick fire question, Dan. Okay. David says, hi guys, I'm not, or should I say I wasn't a pedal fan. Ah. But I want a delay, a reverb, and an overdrive. I play all types of music, mainly blues and jazz. Delay, reverb, overdrive. Well, far out. Blues driver. Um, uh, CXM for the reverb. And uh, the flight, Free the Tone, uh, Future Factory. Um, I'm going to say... Uh, Preamp Mark II for the overdrive. Oh, the overdrive. Um, the overdrive is... Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't. Ages. Walrus Ages. Yeah, okay. Overdrive, Walrus Ages, Reverb, MXR M300, is it called? Y yes, yes. Very good. And Delay, I'm going to go with MXR Carbon Copy. Nice. Okay. There you go. Well played. Good luck. DR says, with your successful rebrand of Tomato Tone... Perhaps you can convince Chase Bliss of a whole line of nightshade-themed petals. <laughs> pedals. Tonatillo, Pimientone. <laughs> that's very good. I love the use of the word <laughs> nightshade. I guess that's that family of... It is, the fa that family of oh, things that sit between man. vegetables and fruits. Is a kumquat in that? I don't know, but it should be. Yeah, Gooseberry. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, very um, good. So anyone that can th throw any uh, light on what's in the Nightshade family and what isn't. There must be a metal band called Nightshade. I hope there is. <laughs> the use of the HM2. If there isn't, then... We have, then we have our new direction. Yeah. He wrote this. <laughs> oh, my God. Dan, we're going to... We're going to absolutely... Collapse under these super chats these this wow. week. Wow. Um, so let's get on to and Dr. Thank you for your continued generosity. Um, Thomas Neeson says, "Hey guys, please never change. I enjoy the talking as much as I do your playing. Also, have any of you tried the Ibanez Talman? I'm intrigued. Now the Talman is the upside down fireman, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. So the Talman is is that the Paul Stanley guitar? I no, not Paul Stanley. Um, it basically, it's sort of like a normal guitar at the back, and it's sort of got a explore, not an explorer thing, but it's. Oh, I've seen those things. Yeah. I think if you turn a Talman upside down, you get the you get the um, Paul Gilbert Fireman. Right, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check this out. Talman. Uh, oh. What do you do with a Talman? No, no, no. It's not that you at all. You dry yourself with it, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, okay, <laughs> Talman is not that. Talman looks like it's this, like a hybrid acoustic thing with a pickup in it. Oh, wow. Um, no, I haven't tried one of those. Yeah. I... Interesting. Mm. Interesting. Um, Do you remember the... when Kramer bought out that Acoustic, yeah, that was a bit like that, yeah, and they were so popular. The Fender have got the Acoustic Sonic, of yeah, course. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember seeing, I remember seeing Chrissy Hine playing one of those old Kramers. Yeah. Anyway, um, one more question from Chicago. After my one from last Monday, says Doug Polginano again. Doug, um, Sweet home, Paul which Ginano. mod do you have on your Analog Man Max One OD Nine? Is it the silver mod or the true vintage? It's not the silver one. 
Um, the way I got that pedal was Dan and I were at Mike's house, of course, in his basement having a jam. <laughs> it was just unreal. <laughs> and I was as you do. I was playing through this old silver face basement, wasn't it? Mm. Fifty watt. Um, and that pedal happened to be there it's on the floor just at Mike's place. Oh no, 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 we played it in the we played it in the factory that yeah, day, and I took it back yeah. to, to jam with it. And it's like, oh my god, I've got to have this. It's just unbelievable. Whatever it is, and I basically begged him to sell it to me. I think he actually made it a gift for me. Um, and so yeah, it's not the silver mod. He says in the Maxons, the silver mod isn't as important as it is in some of the others. Okay. Because they're really nicely made in the first yeah, place. They are, yeah, yeah, they are. Um, which is not to say it's not worth it. It's just to say it's not as important. Because I, I think the silver mod changes some stuff to lower the noise floor and right. all that kind of stuff. So no, it's not the it's not the silver mod. It's the standard, whatever the standard one is, with the bad Bob booster, of mm. course. Mm. Josh Bamey. Josh Bamey says, um, what effect does speaker wattage have on the sound of an amp? So, for example, if you put a 15-watt speaker in a 15-watt amp versus a 50-watt speaker in the same amp. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's just, it's the level of, I guess, what is, I guess, the level of heat that the speaker can dissipate. So, you know, if you... If you have a 15 watt speaker and a 15 watt amplifier, and you've got the, the thing is, if it, if the amplifier was really only 15 watts, then you'd be fine. But the thing is with the valve amplifiers, when you get those things cranked, they're often putting out a lot more wattage than that, and so the speaker has a lot more heat to dissipate through the coil. And um, yeah, so I would say it's just, yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's a headroom thing. Getting that balance right is important. Um, because when the speaker starts working, when it's at the you know being driven properly, it has a different sound as a speaker that just has a massive uh, 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 amount of headroom. Yeah, and a bit like guitars and amps, you know, you can't really just pick one spec point. So the wattage is important, but equally important is the sensitivity of the speaker, yeah, often yeah. called the efficiency. So how loud it is um, in decibels at one meter at one watt is usually how it's measured. Secondly, the magnet material the magnet weight the cone material the cone weight everything about that speaker and how it's made determines how it sounds and the, i would almost say that if you're playing at like normal everyday sort of you know home volumes then almost the speaker wattage is the last thing that you need to worry about because mm -hmm. it's not until you crank the amp which is what he said that it starts happening yeah speaker Distortion and speaker coloration can be a truly magic thing, but yeah. it can also be a colossal pain in the butt if you don't want it. Yeah. Which, personally, I've always liked speakers that are fairly clean sounding. Mm. But then when you hear four awesome greenbacks rattling in a 412 yeah. on the end of a Marshall, well, there's nothing you, like it. Yeah, yeah. I hear an AC15 yep. with a 15, a 15 watt Celestian Blue and it's crying and it's this magic magic a bit, lots of people ask us to do shows on speakers but it's so hard because then you get that self same Marshall 412 that I'm pointing down here to my right on stick a mic in front of each one of those greenbacks and they all sound different yeah 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 any decent engineer or producer will tell you they get a 412 in they listen to all four speakers and decide which one to mic yeah so it's a real crapshoot unfortunately or fortunately <laughs> Um, guys, thank you for your work and keeping us sane, says Gordon Rankin. Gordon, oh, thanks, thanks Gordon. to you and Cheers, thanks mate. for your gifts as well. You sent us some gifts. Yes, he has. Don't think we've received them yet, but no, thank you way. very much way. for your kindness. Um, I missed you guys last week, says David Burke. Glad you're back. No question. Except how cool is it that I acquired a Dr. Z Maz 12 or M12 this week? Uh, also, as it's that pedal show, I should admit to a Mr. Black Tunnel Worm. Nice. I don't know what that Dr. Z is. M12? That's must. Is that a newish thing? I don't know. Cool. We need to get better acquainted with Dr. Z amplifiers. We do. We yeah. really, really do. I think you'd like them a lot. Yeah. Do you know anyone from Dr. Z? Um, I don't. I don't know. I get, get my people to talk to their people. Yeah. And Gordon, your generosity continues to astound us. Thank oh, you. Um, yeah. Amazing, Gordon. Uh, Brian Garcia. Hi, Brian. Nice that you're with us again. He says, hey there. Just a big thanks for making all our Mondays infinitely better. 
I just watched your old Tonewood video with Henning Pauly. <laughs> <laughs> I belly laughed quite a bit. Keep on keeping on. Best uh. wishes from Florida. So we turned up at um, the sort of youtube event that Warwick and Framus put on there in Germany, mm. Hans Peter. Um, guitar... I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, Henning was organising it at the time. So I think we were the first pe people to make a video at that show, and that's the video we made. Yeah. Well, Henning says you can do, you can do any video you want. It doesn't even have to be on. It's just, just whatever you like. And we and, and Henning said to us, "Look, I've re I really want to do a video with you guys." And we said, "Okay, we want to do a video with you. Come with us." And uh, yeah, oh man. <laughs> Bless him, because he was, that was a, you know, good good sport good sport for yeah. doing that. That was really funny. Yeah. DJM check. <laughs> so I loved that all their hits were live. Yeah. All this recorded live with someone with a clapperboard or whatever they do going. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who's not seen it, we hit Ellie oh. Paulie over the head with loads of bits of wood just to, to, <laughs> just to decide which sound the best. Oh man, there was some there was some massive sense of humour breakdowns oh, about that video. Oh, there really was. Tell you what, actually, world, it, this won't include any of you lot because you choose to be here with us, and we we are proud and humbled that you that you do that, and yeah, that the yeah. TPS community is such a lovely bunch of humans. You really are. But man, we've had some humorless bastards on this week. <laughs> I'm really sorry for the sweary, but ah, oh, just some people who just need to get out more. And just take the rod out of their butt and just chill out. Like, massive sense of humour failures. Yes. Yep. So uh, I did have to watch my tongue a couple of times in the comments this week. <laughs> so, uh, like we say, this is not you guys, because if you're here, then you... Are awesome. Yeah, then you probably don't have the sense of humour failure. Anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. Um, DJ Mcheck says... We've always known Mick is great at blues, well thank you, but Dan's blues riffing with Red was amazing on Friday. He and Red blew my mind. I actually oh. went back and listened again, and I'm not someone who listens to blues records very often. Wow. I'll have to go back and listen again. It was blooming interesting actually, so if you didn't catch Friday's show, it was me and Dan on the day before lockdown, we were like, oh god, what are we going to do? We need some videos. So we just picked a few things and just did some things off the cuff real yeah. quick. And one thing we did was Super Reverb and Deluxe Reverb. And it was, you know, when we use those amps, we tend not to crank them to high heaven. And I don't do it very often, but I have done it a lot in my mm. life. Dan, not so much. Never heard, I've never heard that, the, um, the super, super sound like that. Never heard the super sound like that But before. it really brought, I, it was so interesting, because I think it brought things out of both of us. There were yeah. lots of really kind comments about our playing, because yeah. we were just in the moment. Yeah. And, you know, what better example of, the sound sort of taking you a bit. And I think that's what you're talking about there, DJ. Yep. Totally. Yeah, thank you. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was it was it was a nice video. Uh Daniel Webb. Hi Daniel. He says if you were gonna put the Dane, the Thorpe, the Dane, the Danish Pete signature overdrive, into one of the overdrive archetypes, what would it be? I have one and I was thinking of adding a tube screamer. Yeah, full yeah. Tube screamer will go really well with it. The dance of full frequency thing. Yeah. And the boost is full frequency as well. Um, with loads of bottom end if you want it. So yeah, it's um I do I think tube screamer is a really good shout actually. Yeah. I bet on on a certain day you could put a Dane next to a King of Tone and find some similarity yeah. because of its headroom and how quick it is. Yeah. Yep. And the full frequency. Yeah. So we're not saying it's blues breaker derived because it's it's really not that um but it but what dan said about the tube screamer being a very complimentary pairing would mm. definitely work because the eq hump yep totally Pete, pete's not a massive fan of big mid eq humps um michael koverick says michelle koverick says Hi guys, I love the show. I got a Fender Deluxe Reverb FSR, which I think is special Fender Special Reserve or something. Okay. It's a limited edition. With the Alnico speaker, I'm looking for a tweed style drive pedal. What are your recommendations? Uh, True North, I love their tweed drive. Um, I think they've just got back in stock actually, so they're really good. Uh, is it the OnePlus 57? 
Or the Wampler Tweedy Drive. Yeah. Tweed, I think it might even be called the 57 Tweed or the Tweed 57. Yeah, right. Like that. Crazy uh, tube circuits do a really good Tweed pedal. Right, yes. Um, I'm unfortunately forgetting what it's called. Yeah. But that's really good. Yes, it is. Dan Drive Tweedy if you can get one, but... Yeah. Fair. Pretty hard to come by. Yeah, but check out uh, the True North pedal. The True North Tweed, tweed pedal for me, I thought was just exceptional. Yeah, it's not uh, to be to be fair about it. It's not something that's massively in mine and Dan's wheelhouse. We need we need to spend a bit more time with the Tweed thing. Yeah, but yeah, we, we've got to get we, Jesse we know, on and do the the Tweed show. Yeah, we know by by reputation that those ones we've mentioned are, are much loved. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, Michael Force says, Mick and Dan, good to see you. Good always, to see you. I've always wanted a resonator guitar, and my mm. wonderful kids got me a Gretsch G9201 for my birthday. I'm so happy. That's really cool. Happy birthday. And I'm guessing that that's one of the wood, cool. wood body ones, is it? The 9201? Mm. Either way, metal or wood, what a great sound. Incredible. What a brilliant, brilliant sound. Yeah. Nice, congrats. All right, you legends, says Aaron from Albus Band. I've got a 67 Tysco Telestyle Body PG. Tele Body PG. PG. Parental Gardens. Hmm? Nothing. The humour is not getting through this. Oh, sorry. There's no... <laughs> it's me that's the humour this week, isn't it? Um, that I'm going to build it. Uh, should I get vintage Fralins, Warmoth Neck, vintage Tuners? All my love and all of our love to you, uh, Aaron. Um, so you're going to build a parts caster with that body? Yeah. Uh, can't go wrong with Fralins. Um, well, yeah, Warmoth. Warmoth Necks are great. Yeah, there's a lot of good parts suppliers out there now. Mm. Um Tell you what is worth a look is there's a place online called the Stratosphere. Right. Is that where you got your neck from? Yeah, and they sell loads of Fender and Gibson stuff and WD and um, I don't know whether it's seconds or, or what it is, but they've got a hell of a lot of stock. Mm. Um, check them out, the Stratosphere. You might find something interesting. They do really funky things like Wenger and um, Rosewood and Palfero and. I was in Sirencester yesterday. And this little stores opened up. It's really cute. It's but like on one side is a guitar store, on the other side is like I think it's handmade jewelry. I think the husband and wife have got together. They've they've pooled their uh, collective interest and opened up a store that does both. And in the corner was a bin just full of guitar necks. What? Yeah. And I don't see that them often here, but when I was um living in or working in Singapore and around Asia, so many guitar stores had bins with full of necks in them. Well, where did they get these necks from? And Don't there were some, some stores in, in Japan yeah. had that as well. Yeah. We were to, Dan and I were talking about doing a sort of parts of caster challenge. Yes. Which we may... Are you still on that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I gave up when my neck wasn't the right neck, so I had to send it back. So uh, I, I guess I need to pick that mantle up again. Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, David Braniff. Hi, David. He says, I want to give a shout out to my mate Marty Byrne for his song a day for a year challenge. I worked with him yesterday on number 341. <laughs> what? So he's writing a song every day, is he? Far out. Top bloke. To we say thanks, let's get Marty some more views and maybe collabs before the end of 2020. Search... Sad Fay, S A D F A Y, S A D F A Y, on YouTube or Facebook. So go on, check out Marty Byrne then on YouTube or Facebook. Sad Fay, S A D F A Y. Nick and I started writing a song today. Indeed, we did. Indeed, we did. Indeed, we did. The old dudes might sing it in the Christmas video. <laughs> JD Smoking Pipes says, Oh my God. You, that, you, Phenomenal generosity, JD. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, JD. He says, <laughs> you are not alone, by the way. He says, hi, gents. I cringe every time I see those stools you sit on. They're brutal. <laughs> Here's something to put towards some new comfortable stools. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays. Merry Christmas and God bless from Jim. <laughs> um, 
you're not alone in that actually. Some I I've, I've never had a problem with it. Have you? No. The only time I have a problem with it is if we're sat here for a couple of hours. Yeah. And that's a posture thing, though, surely. Yeah, I mean, I've, having the guitar, I just have a little bit of weight in here that make, that solves that right. completely. Should we look into some new stools? The trouble, the thing that annoys me about padded stools is they creak really badly through the microphones. Let's do it with bean bags. Yeah. Massive. Oh, those hanging egg basket seats that we can hang from the rigging. Because they won't creak. <laughs> Okay. That might, might move around. I a wouldn't bit. mind a, a bit of a lumbar rest, actually. Here comes Bubbles. Right, what have we done? What have we done? Uh, We've got quick. a problem. Yeah. What's going it's on, Bubbles? stuff from BB. Ooh. Thanks very much. Uh, right, sorry, we are. Because we're trying to keep up with the super chats, we're missing everything else that's going on. Okay, what's going on? Uh, many questions about the Harmonious Monk and how much it will be. Oh, okay. Um, can we have an answer that, we'll, that we can give out today? Um, yeah, okay, so if you want to know how much the Harmonious Monk is, uh, it might be 249 euros. Right. And it might be 235 pounds. Okay. But it might be 239 pounds or it might be 229 pounds. Okay. We're not entirely sure yet, but it's going to be somewhere around there. Probably 235 pounds 249 euros i think okay. is okay. what it's going to be which is kind of in line with jams um other modulation pedals if that sounds like a lot to you there's a video coming out uh which will show how they're made and it seems cheap to me it's pretty extraordinary yeah, yeah. um joshua alanis who didn't get his question in says dan what are your takes on Eric Johnson's pedal board? I had a chance to talk to his tech mm. about patch cables. Mm. <laughs> he uses George L's and old grey moulded cables. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Eric just likes them. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And there's nothing wrong with just liking something. I've got, I've got um, uh, Mitch that works for us. He's, he's had George L's on his... Uh, pedal board for years and loves them it's like with all those things if you make them right they they i mean i don't think you could pick much in the sound between a george l's cable and a whatever it is we use yeah the the other thing to remember is that he is so comfortable with that rig and to do what he does i mean we, we went and saw him uh in la a couple of years ago i didn't go oh you didn't go yeah, i have seen him i mean i've seen him right yeah. so i'd never seen him before he was just extraordinary. Mm. It, man. It is quite a thing when he kicks on that Marshall, like sparkly clean Fender or two rock or whatever and then he's the, using. And then... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Unreal. Yeah. So you can't... I mean, the, the, so I have this... We, we talk about this quite a lot. You know, there's, there's a whole soldered versus solderless and all this stuff going on. It's the wrong question. It's the wrong question to ask. It really is. Um, I'm starting to get really grumpy about all that stuff. Right. I am a bit grumpy at the moment, by the way, but I'm I'm starting to find my sap rising when people start worrying about that stuff sure. more than, I don't know, your guitar or your amp or heaven forfend what the hell you're trying to play. Sure. Yeah. Because it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, is totally. that too much, Dan? No, I, I, I agree. So, I, you know, if you look at the, the you know, people who are using solderless cable and have done successfully, um, you know, it's not, yeah. It, technically, I guess you could say a really well soldered cable is going to be, um, you know, might have a longer shelf life, but it's, as far as one being great and one being rubbish, it's just not borne out by the evidence. And you've got to go back and look at the evidence. And uh, yeah, so. And equally, you know, there'll be nights and there'll be experiences in your life where you've had the worst guitar lead in the world. Yeah. A bunch of those horrible old molded, well, grey ones, I guess, like you're talking about, but mine were yellow and white when I was playing when I was younger. And some of the most, you know, close to. Transcendent, transcendent yeah, yeah. experiences I've ever had on the p patch cables. I have told people on many occasions to just um, dispose of carefully 
at your local recycling centre. Not throw in the bin. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so it just doesn't. It doesn't matter. Yeah, they're fine. You use what you want to use. Just do it properly. Yeah, and go. and then then like he said, other things start to matter. How reliable are they? Do they? You know, if they're not properly shielded, do they introduce loads of noise? There, All there, that stuff. there are some practical considerations. Yeah, um, and capacitance is a big deal in guitar sounds, but more or less is not better or worse. Exactly. Yep. So, yep. Um, question from Chris Klein. Hello, Chris Klein. I've got a Chico or a Kikognani Echo Limited 2 coming, and I want to run it and a tremolo in parallel at the same time, mm -hmm. not one or the other blended. Do I need two wetter boxes? No. If you want to run them both in parallel, one wetter box. Oh, yeah, put them on either side. You get one of the left hand side, one of the right hand side. Yes. Boom. Also, does the delay have to be 100% out to work correctly? I uh, don't know what that means. No. 100% um, out? Wet. 100% wet. Oh, it's 100 a typo. No. No. If, you, if you're running in parallel, the wetter box will split that signal. Um, so, yeah, you'd be fine. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so you can run the tremolo and the delay completely in parallel and you can mix them however you want. Yeah. But it might be, if, if, but the thing is, if you just want, uh, if, if you're running left and right, you don't need a wetter box. You just need a splitter at the end that goes one into the tremolo, one into the delay, left and right out, happy yeah. days. Um, but the, yeah, the wetter box will do that. This is a really interesting question that I could talk about for probably at least an hour. Okay. So I'll try not to do that. Sub Rosa says, what do you each see in your head when you play? Is it oh. more the geometric shape of chords or notes or is it the actual chord notes or names? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So uh, the it's definitely, it's geometric to a point, but it will be, if I'm doing, Okay, so if I'm playing just A, and I'm and I'm seeing that I'm just seeing that shape, but then if I'm if I'm thinking outside of just the straight major scale harmony, and I start thinking, so you know Lydian, um, then I'm hearing that before I play it. But as soon as I hear it, then that will jump in geometrically in that shape. Um, yeah. I don't see colours or anything like that. I'm not that good. What do you see? If I see shapes or notes, I play really badly. Oh, wow. So if I, if I see, if, I, if my brain has to process what I'm playing, the playing is... Um, laboured, repetitive. I mean, what I play is repetitive anyway, because I don't have a very wide vocabulary, but, and I don't say that in a self-effacing manner, it's a matter of fact, um, largely through choice, because there's a certain sound that I love. Um, but if I start thinking about it, it doesn't, it just doesn't work and it sounds bad. But of course, that's what you've got to do when you practice. You have to think about note name. Mm. I don't know the note names, to be honest. I have to sit there and work it out. But I do definitely think about shapes. Mm. I, I can only play by shape mm. when I'm learning. But on those rare moments when I play my best, or what I feel is my best, or the most free, shall we say, is exactly the same as being free in any other part of your life. So whether it's in relationships or at work or when you're being creative, you're not thinking. Your brain doesn't... Your brain will stop you. If you're thinking, your brain will stop you. It will impede you because it will get in the way. What you need to be doing is flowing. Getting to that point is tough. Yeah. Um, most of us will have been lucky enough to experience it at some time. But the practice is where you do what you're saying and you see shapes and you see notes. But the more you play, then once you're properly connected, you don't see that stuff anymore. Mm. What you feel is harmony and melody and music and yep. that sounds very heady but it's very true and that's what all the best 
players or the people that move you emotionally will be doing. They will be flowing because they've put the work in to the practice to not need to think about it when they're flowing. Now that's not to say <laughs> you get to like the middle eight and you go, oh my God, what chord is it now? Oh, it's that chord. Ugh! Or every time I play Purple Rain and I just, you know, I haven't had to think about anything else. Now I've got to think about this because I can only see it as a shape. And you hear Wendy when she plays it, right? So you can hear her go, oh, shit. <laughs> and she, even she places the root note before she plays it. Yeah, she goes. Actually, I'm not, I don't even know if that is a root note. So it's not to say, it's not to say that it's possible to attain that state of flow all the time. Of course it's not. But that's got to be the goal. Yeah. And it's true of life as much as it is. Because the, the minute your brain gets involved, it's telling you all the wrong stuff. Yeah. I think. I, I agree. Don't trust your brain. It's not to be trusted. It'll land you in the nut house. Um... I'm running a Blues Deluxe and a JTM 45. Oh my god, that's nice. Uh, says Iron Wolf 1776. Uh, as a wet-dry pair, best tones are from my Gibby, Gibson 335 and a Fender Tele. Les Paul and Strat come in next. Yeah, I mean, we all like different things, don't we? There is something about Marshalls and Gibsons. Totally. Totally. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um... It might be that you like that sort of more forward mid. Although Les Paul's got plenty of mid, so I don't know. Yeah, but just personal preference. Yeah, yeah, nice. Personal preference. Very nice indeed. I love you, gents, says Jacob Parker. We love you too. Thank Jacob. you, Jacob. Can't tell you how enough, how great these hangouts are for our happiness these days. Whatever happened to that massive secret pedal? Everyone was too busy. Is what happened yeah um and it would be great to pick it up actually because it was killer it was awesome it was absolutely brilliant okay I there's a conversation get... to have yeah 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 it's as with all these things you know um sometimes having the time to just make the phone call and have the discussion and push it forward which i'm really bad at actually i should make a public apology to everyone that keeps emailing me asking for something and i'm not replying to anybody just because i oh, I can't even get my own work done, you know? Yeah. Which is not a frustration with the people that are emailing you. It's just it, sometimes just, you know this, right? To wake up in the morning, get everything you do need done and make it back to bed is hard enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not that we have hard lives, but I don't know. We, we touched on it earlier. We don't, yeah, but we COVID have. COVID has been. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Busy, busy lives, busy yeah. lives. Yeah, yeah, and too busy, you know, just trying to cram too much stuff in yeah, them. Yeah. And then you totally. had a spaniel, idiot. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it would be great to to revisit that, Jacob. Um, DJM check says, uh, I'm not saying anyone's better. Just that I didn't know that Dan was such a great blues player. You were both great players. We didn't, we didn't take it that way. No, not at We all. didn't take it's it that just way. Just a lovely compliment. Thank and you. And it's totally cool, you know. Um, Dan and I get a lot of very, very nice comments on uh, in the comment sections about our respective playing, and we get some less nice ones, <laughs> which is totally cool. You know, there are people who think John Mayer is a rubbish guitar player. Yeah. So you you can't you can't please all the people all the time. No, this is very. And true. we are. Immensely grateful for all the kind words we do get. Yeah, that's Thank lovely. You. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. How do you feel about the HM2 Wazza being announced? Oh. Says Project Balrog. Yeah, good, because I've been trying to find one for a while. Um, I've got this thing. I want to do it. I want to get all of Boss's metal pedals in and um, get uh, uh, England. Oh, Ola. 
get Ola to come over. Oh, that'll be cool. And do it, do a show with all the Boss metal pedals. Nice. So yes, yeah, so I've been trying to find an HM2, but yeah, that'd be fun. The uh, yeah, the, I was a HM2. Very cool. I'm not sure. What so so they've done they so they did the the HM the original HM2 the, the black one with the yellow knobs. And it was the sound of Swedish metal, apparently. And there's a, like, everything Max. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking of the Metal Zone. I'm thinking this is old news. Yeah, HM2 no, is no. different. Is HM2 it? is different. And apparently it was the sound of Swedish metal. When oh, it came wow. Out. So, yeah. It's, and they're doing a, a Was a Craft version of it. Great. Yeah, it'd be really interesting. <laughs> we went to Japan with Ola, and it was just, yeah, I had the best trip. And haven't seen him since. So it'd be, you know, good to, um, I'm Guess not being Monday. deliberately rude in my reaction, by the way. I just have no... You know, it's like if you went out and talked to my dog about cars, mm. you'd get the same reaction. Yeah, yeah. I, I She's had got one no when idea. I like, when I was 17, I had one. It was like one of my... Fir one of my... I only had a, ever had a handful of pedals before I had the Roland GP8. Um, or did I have one? I think I just loaned it from... A friend had one, I loaned it from him for a while. I remember turning it on going, it's buzzy. <laughs> big, big, great show. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to learn about it, you know, to, to yeah. try and... I can't, I can't say I'm ever going to like those guitar sounds. But, but I'd it's be interesting. In, I'd be interested to know why someone like Ola likes it. Yeah, yeah. What is it that, that lights him up about it? Yeah, sure. So that would be interesting in itself. Um, no question, I just love the show, says Morton Peterson. Thank oh, you. thanks, Morton. Thank you. Question for Dan. Have you ever struggled to balance the treble between your neck and bridge pickups on the telly? How do you solve it? I may disconnect the tone pot from my neck pickup for better balance, says DW. Okay. Red, the tone pot is disconnected from the neck pickup. Is it? Yeah. And has it always been? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because I struggle. Well, why? It just because there's no, uh, basically, you don't have that. Gets rid of the load. Uh, yeah, yeah. If, even with, even with it connected to a, I mean, it's a two fifty k pot, right? But there's still that um, bit of resistance that allows that tiny bit of capacitor in. Yeah. Same thing. If you, you know, if you just connect the, um, you you disconnect the tone pot. There's just more. However. Um, I would never disconnect the tone pot from the bridge, and if you if I'm in the middle position, the tone pot's on. Yeah. But in the neck pickup, because I never, I, you know, until recently, I'd never used the <laughs> tone control. Um, and so I probably wouldn't do it now. But on red, the tone pot isn't isn't on the neck pickup. So that's option one then, like you say. Option two is I know a lot of telly players who always have the bridge pickup tone back to about eighty percent. Mm. And that just takes off that shrill high end. Now that is absolute sacrilege to a lot of telly, to yeah, a lot yeah. of other telly players who just love that, you know, extended. I like, even know some telly players who have no, nothing connected to the bridge pickup at all. Right, straight it's out. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, it's going to depend on your app. So, one, make the neck pickup brighter by disconnecting that tone pot. Could be a could be a shout. Number two, just roll off the. Um, tone when you're on the bridge pickup and adjust everything else to suit. I really love the sound of a telly like that, personally. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Good luck. Michael McKnight. Oh, I wonder if that's you, Michael McKnight. I wonder if it's And if it is, welcome. Yes, welcome. indeed. Um, <laughs> this is a great question. What I need, what I actually need, and what I would like often turn out to be very different. Is this something you experience, and how do you manage that? How so, can you help us make better choices? So, so a big part of why we started was having the ability to, to understand that it's not about... Having the ability to know that asking the right question, asking a better question, um, you know, you, you... I guess there's so many opinions and... and that it's really strongly held belief systems around this stuff 
but the more that you understand it the more that you understand actually it's all just it is all just opinion it's all everything is um you know shades of nuance as far as what you want to achieve so just understanding that the better the question that you can ask the closer that you'll get to what you want yeah as opposed to um yeah it's a way that you frame that yeah and also bear in mind that not everything is the same all the time so you go you definitely go through phases where mm. you like this and then six months later you might not like that or two years later you might be playing a completely different yeah type of guitar or sound or something so it's expensive and it's frustrating but just to go through loads of different stuff yeah and and get that experience of what you like and what you don't like and i totally agree with you you know i've been so fixated on strats for example where i've just been chasing this thing that i've built up to this thing that i need to chase and then one day i'll be playing my 335 and thinking oh, i never want another guitar yeah, as long yeah, as i live yeah, yeah. and and then the next day you're playing something else so it's just i think it's having the courage to follow the muse in mm -hmm. the first place is a, is a really good thing to do and if it's if that thing that you're chasing isn't talking to you stop it and do something else yeah and no you know knowing when that moment arrives is is just as important i think Totally. And of course, Dan and I are in an extremely lucky and privileged position to be able to have all this stuff. Mm. Flip side of that coin is because, you know, everything everything has a flip side. Everything has its equal and exact opposite. The, the, the flip side of that coin is that being forced into having to make a more limited choice can often be a much better route to creativity. Yep. Totally. You... Who was it that said, um, it's so much better to have one piece of gear and just understand it 100% than 100 bits of gear and sort of know know each one a little bit, you know. Um, it's yeah, like with this... We're, we're did terribly that, guilty of that. Yeah, well, when we did the show on, on Is the Timeline Still King, take any one of those pedals and they're all amazing. The trick is actually knowing and understanding what it can do, you know. Yeah. Timeline's incredible. If you can drive it, and if you understand how it works, ecosystem, unbelievable. But you've got to know how that thing works. Yeah. You know, otherwise you you lose yourself in working out how it works. Yeah, and then asking that endless question, which is better? Yeah, is better. Yeah, oh my yeah. god, that's better. That you know, <laughs> a goal. Dan and I've been talking about what happens to TPS in the future, mm. how we evolve. You know, what what, what do we We've covered a lot of ground and we still want to cover a lot of ground. One thing I would love for us to be able to achieve is to get more people to understand that there is no better. Yeah. It's just what you connect with and how do we get there? Yeah. How do you That's have good, the courage yeah. to choose what's right for you and not think that the answer lies in the next overdrive pedal? Yeah. Because it probably doesn't. Yeah. Depending on what mood you're in. Yeah. Unless, of course, it's a tomato tone. Yeah, well, you know, I think that's a good case in point. So here you go, Michael. It, uh, and if that is you, Michael McKnight, by the way, it's good to, great to hear from you. Um, uh, so I would never, I'm pointing at the preamp mark 2 and the cxm78 from chase bliss i would never in a million years have thought about using something like that mm. a basically you know what is it a multi-effect sure the drive pedal because it does a bunch of different drives mm -hmm. would never consider that it's got midi and one day one it's relatively complex mm -hmm. and it's horrifically expensive mm -hmm. and i heard it and i'm like I'm using that. CXM78. I don't even like reverb pedals. I think they all sound cheesy. You know, for in my personal opinion. Because yep. I don't know how to use it. Not because they sound cheesy. Because I don't know how to use it. I hear that thing and I'm like, I'm never taking this off my board. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. It's very funny that we will actually end up with similar, very similar boards. Yeah. That will sound miles apart. 
Yeah, yeah. I was saying to Catherine, I can't wait to do the first gig once um, COVID is lifted, oh, yeah. <laughs> or at least the vaccine gets underway, or how, whatever happens next, you know, once we get out and start playing again. And I've said to her, I know what's going to happen. First gig, that guy or that girl is going to be there dancing around with a pint of cider. <laughs> <laughs> like, not in time. <laughs> Clapping on the twos and fours. Yeah. And it, that pint of cider is going to go in my faders. Darth Vader. So I was thinking about a little screen. Right. But um, anyway, blah, blah, blah. I'm absolutely yakking about nothing now. Ben Butterworth. Nice to hear hey, from you, Ben. ben. Um, I've just realised what I've done. What have you done? I'm saying Michael McKnight. I'm thinking of Philip McKnight. I thought you might be doing that. Yeah, there's no way Philip McKnight would watch us. <laughs> so, Michael McKnight, I apologise for confusing you with Philip McKnight, who is a, 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 a um, contemporary of ours in this in this world, who we are lucky enough to meet up with on various shows and things like that. Anyway, apologies. Um, ben Butterworth, nice to hear from you, Ben. Glad you're back. Any thoughts on the Effectro Delta Trem tube? It looks and sounds awesome, but it's big and has tubes. Yes. Uh, any versatile tremolo alternatives? Uh, the Effectro Delta Trem is absolutely glorious. What is it? I've never tried it. It's a tube-driven tremolo. So like a biased type trem? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, but man, I, I love their modulation effects. The um, His vibe, his tube vibe far out mm. they never heard anything like it it's superb yeah. I have heard that just unreal he's that guy he is so switched on um, yeah I, I I love his stuff and yeah the the trem is exceptional absolutely exceptional but it's it's big you know how important is trem to you if you use it for in every song if you, you know or you know lots of songs and it's a core part of your sound Amazing. If you mm. if you stick it on once at the end of set two, you might. So, am I assuming that the relevance of the having valves in it is because proper bias tremolo? For anyone who doesn't know, uh, one way of doing tremolo is to affect the bias of the tubes, doing the output, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the up and down in the volume. Is that what's happening? Yeah. Yeah. So there's totally. no other way to do that. No, there isn't. But it's also, you know, tube driven preamp and all that stuff, yeah, as yeah. all of his pedals are. So it's going to be awesome. Ah, it's, it's insane. Yeah. We'll so also good. check out the new, the two new offerings from Origin. Dan and I are going to do a show. Um, there's two, one that's been out for a while, and then the um, Magnetone based yes. one. Yes. I think that only does harmonic tremolo. I could, I could enti entirely be wrong. So. Uh, ignore the detail of this answer. Check out the new Origin Trems too, because they will be very good. Yeah. And of course, who knows if uh, two idiots on YouTube aren't going to release a um, really nice tremolo pedal soon. <clears throat> Indeed. Yeah, I, I can tell you now, that won't do uh, bias valve tremolo as well as Phil's yeah, effect road. No, nothing does it like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Colin Giron, Colin Giron, he says, what's your process for deciding what makes it onto the board? I tend to want everything, but I don't utilise everything. I know mm. it's preference, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Uh, the first thing is deciding the amp. So, you know, I've got the match that I'm looking to buy a super, and how to go with that. Like we did some recording today, and th these two amps together, when you hear them together in the room, it's just like, it's so I'm done. Bonkers, so isn't it? mad. Um, so once you've got that sorted out, and you've got a fairly decent idea about the guitars and things that you want to use, then it's working out with the pedals that work with that setup. So, and it's you know it's years and years of trying stuff, and you know that's, that's the great thing about pedals because you can try something, and then you can swap them out without having to redesign your whole system they're like modular um tone boxes they're wonderful so yeah having start with the gain stages and work out the gain stages that are going to work with your guitars and the amplifier and then color to taste 
Yeah, I guess if you've got loads of pedals, you'll you'll have moods where you're into certain things. Totally. One of the one of the things I love, or and you know, thanks to Dan, have learned to love about pedals is exactly that. You know, if you've got a board that's got three overdrive spaces, two modulation spaces, two delay spaces, and a reverb space, then there's no reason why you can't just swap stuff in and out. Yeah. yeah. Um, depending on how you're feeling. So I, I definitely, I think everyone's probably the same, mm. but I definitely go through periods of wanting everything and really complex and mm. all the rest of it. And at the moment, and for some time I've been in a... Minimalist. I just need, I need fewer things. Yeah. Some yeah. of that is pure practicality because doing this show, I'll build a really lovely board and then the next week we'll be doing something and it will just get torn to pieces because we need some things off it. And it drives me nuts because it takes me hours to build a flipping board. Yeah. I think we build your board, then you leave it at home. Yeah. Don't bring it in. But at the moment, you know, the, my pedal board, which uh, I'm going to show you again in, in rubbish colour. Please excuse the colour. Um, this is doing most of the overdrive, the Chase Bliss Automaton Mark II preamp. This is a new fuzz I've got from Down Drive, which is doing a Zonk machine harmonic trem and normal trem, future factory delay and a reverb. And I, given that we don't have any gigs at the moment, and I'm just, you know, messing about in here, mm. trying to get inspired with sound, I can get pretty much everything I need out of that. So now that I really like the sound of this, and there's a couple things to add, um, I just need to get it wired up to uh, my Atom, G3 Atom, to do the switching so that you know there's not tap dancing going on mm -hmm. and to handle the wet dry split and all that and that's that's it that'll be it for a minute yeah how long i don't know yeah, yeah but the sounds coming out of this this little little albeit eye-wateringly expensive rig yeah uh ah oh, it's incredible totally inspiring yeah, yeah. So the, the free that that future factory and the six sound together. When I first heard those two together, I just I knew that certainly for a period of time, that's the delay and reverb. That I've you know the obviously, we both love the future factory and just the how. Just the clarity and and the possibilities with it, but man, when I heard the CXM just blew my mind i can't I, I just can't get away from those short room reverbs yeah it's incredible it's such a great sound yeah. we've so it's quarter two do we have many uh yeah please no more super chats because yeah. i think we're miles behind yeah. so let's let's hurry up thanks everyone yeah um david rustad mick your gnl asat experience thoughts on the pickups i have a really nice asat special that i've been playing um i'm thinking about selling it because the middle position is tricky hmm. um Bizarre, it's one of those things, isn't it? Because I've always said I don't like ceramic magnet pickups. Yeah, love those pickups. Yeah, but that guitar spent 98% of its time on the bridge pickup through an orange OTR 120. Nice, cranked. All right, so I didn't really use the other positions, right? I get it because they're a million miles apart, those pickups. Yeah, so that might be why it sounds a bit phasey or you know, sounds a bit interesting, super honky. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, if you're not if you're not going with it, but there we are. Um, Matthew Frederick, let's say you just discovered a stack of old trading cards that could be worth five to six K. Ah, what? Which Collings do you turn them into? <laughs> ah, <laughs> I-35. Any Collings. Yeah. Uh, I, really, I would turn them into I-35. You, you want an I-35? Yeah. So the 335 style. Um, I like the Soko, which is like a single cut. I like all the laminate ones rather mm. than the carved top ones. The guitar that I would really, really like, I'm, I really want an SG at the moment, and I don't know what's stopping me. I would like to try a... Um, so I've got a 290. Mm. They do it in a single cutaway with two humbuckers, just mahogany body, mahogany neck. I would love to try that guitar as just a simple mahogany two humbucker guitar. Right, okay. I don't think it would be quite as piercing as a... Uh, through as an SG, right? But that SG's a different animal. There's something they're su they're such cool guitars. I remember seeing Paul Stacey um, when I first saw Paul Stacey. He was playing with Neil Finn, and that 
that SG did a l- load of the heavy lifting for that tour. I love him. And the the I mean, he's got, that's a '63, I think he's got the clean sound in that guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just mind blowing. Check out the Soko as well. That's a really cool guitar. Soko's I think I just re- I, I mentioned that, but anyway, good luck. Uh, 360. I love the 360. Yeah, that's very cool. Cracking sounding thing. Go with the heart. Go with the heart. Um, Richard Chester says, "Can G2 and G3 Atom be linked together? I've run out of loops on my G2, including two remote loopy twos." Uh, yes. Um, I mean, you can link them together from you know one output from one to the input of the, of the other, or you can have your G2 in a loop of G3. I mean, there are ways to do it. Um, yeah, if you want some more advice of that, just email through. You can, can't you link two G2s together? Well, you can, yeah, you know, via MIDI and yeah. stuff. Yeah, sure. Good luck. Ethan Kaplan. Uh, no more Super Chats, by the way, please, because I think Dan and I are going to struggle to get through them. Um, I see. Oh, here we go. Ethan, I feel your pain. He says, I've seen different views on where to put fuzzes in the signal chain. Is it better to have it first and then the Dynacomp after? So the reason for this question is common placement of compressor for a lot of people is mm. first in the chain. Yep. Common placement of fuzz is first in the chain. Yep. Common placement for wah wah is first in the chain. Mm-hmm. So if you've got a compressor and a fuzz, how do you deal with that? So Dynacomp is a buffered pedal, right? And what I mean by that, when, when you hear if pedal is buffered or not, they're talking about the state in its bypass. So if it's true bypass, it, it won't affect this, uh, the signal when it's turned off. The Dynacomp is buffered, so when it's uh, the effect is off, but the pedal is powered, uh, the signal is still going through a buffer. Now that buffer, if you put that at the input of your fuzz, will have a big impact on how that fuzz sounds. However, if you put your guitar into the fuzz and then the fuzz into the um, Dynacomp, it will still have an impact, but it, you've got a much better chance of it being usable. Um, you know, wah again, the uh, same thing. You, you know, a true bypass wah, very important if you're gonna have that at the start of your signal chain. Um, yeah, but I would say absolutely fuzz first, fuzz first. into your data comp. Yeah, you're never yeah. gonna put the. You're never gonna have. Not never, but. It would be rare to be in a situation where you would want to have your Dynacomp on going into your fuzz because the fuzz, the nature of the fuzz is it's limiting. Yeah. So to stick more limited signals it's already into doing the fuzz, that. it's already doing that. Yeah. So yeah, fuzz first, Dynacomp second. Yeah, I would agree. And of course it depends on the fuzz. Yeah. yeah. Um, Andrew Eason Bentley says, uh, I own a hamster trim. Oh, nice. We should have mentioned the hamster trim earlier. It's really great. Uh, and the gig rig soft switch is so much better to use than a standard switch. Any possibility of other brands using it? Uh, we've I I sent switches out to every pedal company, and the problem is that they're really expensive. They're crazy expensive. Yeah, they're, so they're milled from stainless steel. And Dan, would you could you offer some? I'm, I'm going to share a bit of knowledge that maybe I should or shouldn't share. Can you tell me if a standard on off switch like you find in most pedals costs one mm-hmm. how much does an octo kick switch cost five five so it's five times more expensive yes there is a number a multiple by which build cost gets multiplied by the time you get to retail cost mm-hmm. let's say for example it's six let's say for example it's six and this this is not going to be true for every company right mm-hmm so if your standard switch costs one, by the time it hits the retail, the cost of that switch in that pedal is six. Mm-hmm. If it costs five, the time you hit that pedal hits retail, it's 30. Mm-hmm. And that is literally how that works. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that those are the multiples. Some pedals will be six, some pedals will be 10, some pedals will be one. Everyone says components don't make a difference to how much a product ends up costing, they flipping well do. Boy, do they ever. <laughs> oh my, who says that? People say it, Idiots. they're like, oh, just, you know, you can just build this, it, these, these, these things cost nothing. 
and you could just throw it together. You know, you don't have to pay your staff healthcare or any of that. You know, you don't even have to pay them wages. You don't have to provide them a clean and safe environment in which to work. You don't have to pay their tax contributions. You don't have to contribute to their pension or medical bills. You don't have to do any of that. You can just not pay anyone anything and pedals are so cheap to make. Sorry, bit of frustration at how easy internet keyboard warriors think companies are to run. They're not yeah. they're really hard to run and make money. The, so the reason that we designed that, if you like, if you've got a an effects pedal and it's got a foot switch on it, and that foot switch goes, um, because it's the thing that you're stepping on all the time. It's the thing that you come into contact with most, and that's where all the pressure goes. So the foot switch is the thing that fails most often on the pedal. Um, the foot switch was the only thing I think in, in G2 that we didn't design originally and if you imagine we've got 14 foot switches on that you've only got to break one and the whole thing has to go back for repair mm. so we just got to a point it's like Matt, this is stupid we need to design something that's you know bulletproof so that's how that came about now um, and we did you know I thought this is really great if and you know and I did offer it out to a bunch of people if they wanted us to do stuff. Yeah, yeah. And Hampstead were the only people that said, we love this, we want to put it in our things. Yeah. And, you know, there you go. Yeah. But it is, and they said, yeah, it's, it's worth it to us to put it in there. Yeah, I mean, obviously um, you can you can suck that cost up if you're making it somewhere else, but it's not, any any company with an accounts department certainly wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. But that's, so that's the reason. Yeah. Um, Ethan again says, uh, I built a pedal board with a Quartermaster 6. But I've run out of loops. Do I combine certain types of pedal in a single loop to save space? You, I mean, you, you absolutely can do. Um, it depends on the pedals that you use most often. It depends on the uh, the effect of bypassing that pedal in your signal chain. So, for example, um, if I have three overdrive, three gain stages that I use all the time, and you know, I'm constantly going between them then I'll have one, I'll have a loop for each one. But if I've got a chorus, a phaser, a flanger, and a vibe pedal, and I rarely use them, I can put them all in one loop and sort of pre-select the one that I want for that song or part, you and then the it's, yeah, it's yeah. on. But the great thing is they're all in one loop and they're all out of the way when yeah. you're using them. So yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a, I remember actually the first, the first quartermaster I ever built, I built by hand for uh, Aziz. Oh, uh, Aziz Ibrahim. Aziz Ibrahim. Oh, cool. Um, who's, man, he's astonishing. Um, and he had all of his, he, we built this rig for uh, Steve Wilson when he was playing with Steve Wilson. And he had, I think I made him like a, I think it was an eight quartermaster. Like, the, you know, I went down to B&Q and just got metal and, you know, just built it. And he had like four overdrives in one loop and two mm. things in another. And he just stacked all these things up. And so he would just go along and kick them on as he needed. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, absolutely you can do Definitely that. Definitely do that, yeah. Uh, Guitar George, he knows all the chords. Guitar George 55. Um, he says, cheers guys. My wife gave me a radio ABY for my upcoming birthday, 65th birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Congrats, George. Um, I've finally been able to set up my wet dry with a trainer uh, YCV20 and a 76 Champ. As others have found, what a revelation. Yeah. Thanks for all I've learned from TPS. Awesome. There Thanks you go. for being with us, George. Yes. Yeah, uh, Baseman Dudge says... He knows all the fudge. <laughs> Hi, Leggins. <laughs> so it's something we used to say on Guitarist Magazine all the time. Yeah, he's a real leg end. Um, I picked up a Thorpey Peacekeeper. Nice. To flip... Naughty boy. Uh, but it's too good to sell. So now I have a Thorpey, DM Drive, Green Rhino, and a Reeves 2 and 2 Face. Looking for a gain stacking starting point. Fuzz first. Yep. Thorpey second. Yep. DM next, Green Rhino last. What's the Green Rhino? That's the trouble, that's the tube, tube screamer. Is it? Is it? Oh, uh, no, no, no. Sorry, I was thinking of the um, one that's that great big long chip that looks like a centipede. Oh, no, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, you're thinking of the, ah, uh, come on, brain. Yeah, that one. That one. The Red Llama. Red Llama. Um, okay, so definitely the, the, the first I'm first. I'm ding dong. 
do the fuzz first and then it's sort of open season after that yeah uh, my standard way of doing it is i put the least gainy things last so the things that you're going to run most gainy have them so put them in decreasing orders of gain so that what i personally like is when i step on the next pedal it doesn't crap out and get really squashy mm. dan often does it the other way around because he likes that gain stacking relationship yeah so it's really about what you want to squash what exactly yeah have a play brent porter i'm late to the party today but i've got a gig rig question is gig rig us the best place to buy a humdinger in the us uh to benefit you or is there a retailer no uh so we don't have retailers in the us we sell direct in the us and we have a hub set up in delaware which is our fulfillment place so if you the gig rig us is just the website that goes through to our fulfillment house so it still all just comes through to us here so yes yes Thank Jolly, you. Jolly Willard. Hi, Jolly. Thanks hey, for Jolly. being with us. Uh, good to see the hairy pickers back together again. <laughs> I've tried turning up and I love it. Yeah, you do. I'm considering an Iron Man 2 for my Fender Showman. Oh, nice. Thoughts on that and will it be on TPS sometime too? Yes, it will. It will be. They just sent us one, actually. Yeah, best attenuator that we've ever heard. The, the little one is the best attenuator I've ever heard. have never tried the big one, so no. let's do that. Captain Sexy 90 says, where is the rack special? Where's yeah, the 80s rack yeah, special? Yeah. I'm dying for some Lush Lando tones. Love from Captain Sexy. Um, yeah. Uh, Did we film it? We, we need to do it. Um, Real World, our friend at Real World said they might be able to loan us some choice units. So um, Great. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. To be honest, the COVID gonads has left me very unwilling to m make any effort to anything at the moment because everything is so hard you've got to blooming disinfect everything and wear masks and all that cobblers which is the right thing to do by the way but yes it's not it's cobblers. really it's boring and it takes ages yeah that's yeah it's not cobblers it's just boring. Uh, apologies if you're sensing a sense of resignment in me today or resignation should i say <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm tired. The dog is making me tired. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's uh, been, Rose has been a big... I really am bored of COVID. Yeah, I know, I know. We and, all are. You know, our hearts go out to people who've been affected by it in, in a big, in a bigger way than we have. So I, I don't want to sound, um, I don't want to sound anything other than caring about what's going on in other people's lives. First immunization is tomorrow. In it is. Okay. Yep, Great. starts tomorrow. Nice. Yeah. Sign me up, baby. Can I have one in this arm as well? And if you... No, I'm not even going to go there. Uh, <laughs> right. The Best of the 70s says, Hey, Mick and Dan, I sent an email with BB King in the subject line. I'd like to... hire him to help me build the rig. BB King's dead. And he was rubbish. Oh, he wants you to build the rig. Okay. Um that I'm building around the G3. Could he check his email and get back to me? Um, please email support at the gig rig. Yeah. Yeah. So Dan has a team of people that help him do that, obviously. Yeah, if email through any gig rig stuff, email support at the gig rig.com and, and it will go to um, people that don't have a thousand. Uh, I mean, I do try and get to my emails, but it does take me a long time. But go yeah, to yeah. support and we'll we'll get you sorted. Absolutely. Yeah. Nico M says, hey, guys, I'm not happy with my TC flashback and Hall of Fame in terms of fidelity. Would there be a significant upgrade with the Source Audio Collider? Cheers. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That thing is incredible. It's great. Uh, everyone knows I'm a bit grumpy about digital multi-effects. Um, I'll use that every day of the week. Yeah. Wonderful. It sounds brilliant. Yep. And it's so easy to use. Yeah. Really great. Um, which is not to say there aren't other brilliant pedals out there, but we, both of us, would recommend that unreservedly. Yep. Absolutely. And it's pretty well priced as well. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on pot tapers, says Daniel Chavez. Uh, my Les Paul is linear. 335 is mixed. And my Stratton Telly have audio. I go back and forth on preference. Looking for consistent experience on all guitars. 
what are the pros and cons? For anyone who doesn't know, um, a pot on a guitar goes from naught to 11. <laughs> it goes from naught to 10 usually. And the taper means how quickly it goes from zero to maximum. Yeah, so is, is the sender point five? Yes. The problem comes that human hearing is not linear. Mm. And in order to address this, pots have what's called a logarithmic taper. Some of them do, which is also called an audio taper. Dan. Yeah, so it, it, it's um, that taper, uh, instead of being a, a, a straight line, it's more of a curve. And you get, you know, supposed to uh, match closer to the way that we hear. So yeah. that even though on the scope, you know, you look at lots of that, it's, you know, sounds smoother. Yeah, because if, you, if you've got um, a linear taper pot, you turn down to five, there can be plenty of instances where you don't perceive much of a drop in volume. Yeah. Whereas if you've got a logarithmic taper pot and you're on a strap, for example, you go from 10 to nine, the drop-off can be significant. Mm. So but personally, my preference is definitely for logarithmic audio taper pots, just mm -hmm. because that's what I played my whole life. Same for you? Totally. But really, it's about... You know, what do you want that guitar to do? And if, for example, it's a 335 and it's got humbuckers, then the very nature of turning down the volume on that is going to be radically different from a Strat or a Tele anyway. Yep, yep. So by simply replacing the audio taper pot with a linear one, the experience would be different in the different guitars anyway. Yep, totally. Is that fair? Yep, totally. Yeah. I, for me, it's easier with, with, linear ta with audio taper ones logarithmic ones because you don't have to move the pot so far yeah yeah because there's a massive thing between here and here yeah 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 good luck good luck soren led it hi soren. Hey, soren nice to hear from you um they just announced the second lockdown here in copenhagen oh i'm sorry oh, to mate. That. um you got me through the first one i'm counting on you to get me through the second one we'll do what we can we will absolutely do what we can i have i have to admit that there have been days where the only reason I've been interested in filming is because I know there are people out there mm. who want to watch the show. Yeah. Which is not like, it sounds self-aggrandizing. I don't mean it to sound like that. The motivation for doing it is because I know people want to watch it. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's uh, So we hope you're doing all right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone ignored the last lockdown here in the UK. Mm. It was busy, man. It was busy. Yeah. But there we are. Thoughts on the Greg Cock Little Heat Pedal. Lil Heat Pedal. My favourite pedal right now, says Joel Morris. Um, is that the one he's done with Andertons? I don't know. And um, Tone City? Well, he never called us. He never told us about it. Yeah. What's going on? Haven't heard it. Cockers? If, if it's got Greg's name on it and he likes it, it's going to be awesome, isn't yep. it? Yep. Hey, fellas. I'm doing a job on my Highway One Telly, says Eric Williamson, and was hoping you could recommend tuners, fret sizes, pickups, and pots. Are there kits you would recommend? It's for blues and rock, but mostly blues. Right, frets. Dan and I like 6105s. Very much so. But you might not. The good thing about 6105s is they're fairly narrow, but they're quite tall. Yeah. So blues, hopefully you're going to be doing loads of string bending. Um, and that's really good for that. A little, good for intonation as well. Yeah, a bit taller on the fret means you can get under the string a bit more. So that could be a good shout. I think Sit I'm going to put those in, in here, actually. Dunlop 6105. Steve Ray Vaughan used 6100, if that's interesting to you. Bass frets, very wide. Makes intonating quite difficult. It does. Um, tuners. Ah. Gotto? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. My favourite tuners have and always will be the split shaft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Collusion so, style fender ones. What? Like, yep. Like those, but it depends. Um, and they look right too. They do. Nothing else looks right on a on a telly for me. Um, I think. Yeah, it's it's pickups and pots. Oh, Cluson, the Clusons. Yeah, I would. I would, Eric, I would always, always, always go for as close to vintage spec as you can possibly get. But there's a lot of people who would disagree with that entirely. So I guess 
it's really up to sort of you know what are you leaning towards what's your brain telling you that you should be doing yeah you know th there are people who swear by locking tuners i swear at them um etc etc it's just personal preference personal preference yeah that stuff is fun yeah. you have fun doing that it sounds like a fun project yeah um kits would do we recommend kits I don't. I mean, no, I don't it, know. If, if, if I, your soldering isn't great, then you could look at a pre-wired, yeah, pre-wired thing. Harness. But part of the fun of all of this is soldering it wrong the first three times and getting it right the fourth. Totally. Isn't it? <laughs> Just have a nice supply of vitamin E cream. Yeah. Your hand, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't put any heavy objects that you can launch out of windows. Yes. All of that. Aloe vera for the burns. Yeah. So, um, sorry if that's not a very helpful answer, but um, I. I Personally, would just go for the most vintage spec stuff possible. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a supplier that I get all my stuff from in Germany called crazyparts.de. Crazy Parts. Very good. I, I'm only sorry that they didn't spell the crazy with a K, because then it would have... And Z double E. Yeah. Crazy! And then I'd have... And they have those, those blow-up guys at the front of the yeah. door that, yeah, that yeah. are doing this all day yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. with, with those blow-up guitars as well. <laughs> Chris Bloomer. Hi, Chris. Uh, he says, uh, Greeting, greetings, gents. Hi to you, Chris. Um, how would you power hand-wired effects like a memory man or a tube driver? Vic P. I've got my board powered by the gig rig. Have my board powered by the gig rig. Just run the board and effects off a power strip. Oh, I see. Yeah, right. So you need, if the memory man needs 24 volts or something, yep. is it crazy? Yeah. So, yeah, there's a thing called Electroman um, that f for that one. Tube driver, the BK Butler tube driver, that's mains power, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, if you if you send a list of your stuff through, again, to support the gig rigger, then we'll, um, we'll, we'll have a look at that for you and steer you in the right direction. Yeah, Dan does do a thing for the memory man, though. Yeah, do a special little adapter called the... Yeah. Uh, called the... Electroman, which is a special 9 to 24 volt adapter. So. Slap Hand from, from Norway says, uh, Slap Hand. I wonder if you're a, a double bass player. Okay. Oh, man. They're amazing, those yeah. guys. Yeah. There's, a, there's an amazing um, a rock, a, like Australian band called The Living End. Yeah, yeah, Chris Cheney. Far out. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a really good girl Swedish rock and roll band called the Slaptones. I know, it, it doesn't translate well, but it was called Slaptones because of that. Right. They were brilliant. Anyway, um, Slaphand says, For Dan, with love, for, with love from Norway, I run uh -huh. a G2 in a stereo rig. When I turn off stomp box, when I turn off a stomp box, it also shuts off one output. What am I doing wrong? You, what you're doing wrong is you are including the outputs when you're setting up the stomp box. Don't do not do that. You need to, when you set up your stomp box, turn off the outputs. Because don't forget, stomp is additive as well as subtractive. So work out the pedal you want to add to the stomp box. Have that on and only that on. Leave the outputs off, and then when you add it in and you take it out, you'll be fine. So am I understanding it right? Select stomp box mode. You select the preset you want to program. You select the loops that you want to add in stomp box mode. Turn the outputs off. Make sure that everything else is turned off. Then hit stomp box mode. Now, when you're on your preset and you add that stomp box mode in, only that loop's going to be added in. And when you turn it off, only that loop's going to be taken out. There you go. There you go. So you might need to rewind that and replay it again or make notes and write it down, but that's the answer. Yeah. Good luck. Matt Presley. Is there a pedal that replicates the magic of a fuzz face with your strap volume turned down without having to turn it down? You know what? Uh, it's That is really tricky because a lot of that is the... Um, so, if you have the pickup setting the volume control here and then we're turning that down, that's... that's uh, reducing the level before it hits the capacitance of the cable 
and then that hits the low input impedance of the fuzz and it's that basically the filtering of the cable and the 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 volume control hitting that the capacitance of the cable that creates that mm. doing that on the other side of the cable the yeah, other yeah, side yeah. of the capacitance of the cable is actually really tricky um, it, I, please stick with it please try and stick with using that volume control yeah because there's so much nuance there and there's so much fun in there and I get that people find it difficult yeah to just you know to because you, your brain's going oh I need to turn the volume down and then you forget what you're playing and all of that it's just it's a bit of muscle memory the more you do it the more it will start to feel natural it does open up whole yeah. worlds of stuff uh, the analog man sun faces do have an input resistor mm. which goes some way to doing it but not really yeah it's a, but that's a series resistor yeah it's um, not the same thing no, is it no no but it's a, it's a massive part of the why, why they sound the way they do uh, music therapy Laz says what we really need is a reverb tank tank top for the ladies I'd get one for my li for my wife uh, and tube tops for spring and summer and I was also asked about baby grows yeah we did get some we, we do do ladies tees women's tees and baby stuff and they sell so incredibly slowly yeah, that we yeah. just need to be a bit careful about how many we buy um, interesting metric for you most of us YouTubers here whether male or female have a 98 percent male audience it is true i can wow. tell you it's true here's hoping that that may change mm. but as it stands 97 98 no different from my days in guitar magazines really wow yeah. okay be interested to get some updated figures but yeah it's very male it's very male here um paul becker's and if the answer is, why don't you get more women on there and more women will watch, the evidence is that that does not work. Mm. What you get is more men watching. <laughs> uh, Paul Beckers, sorry to go off topic. Uh, with a huge amount of content online, do you think a paid guitar course still makes sense? And if so, why? I'm contemplating starting the Paul Davids course, awaiting his TPS pedal board show, by the way. Uh, does it make sense? <sighs> Yes, if what the course is going to deliver is what you're after. So, for example, um, courses that I've paid for online, I, I sign up to the masterclass thing, and I pay for that, and it is extraordinary. And I, I love that. Stuff that I've paid for on... Um, I paid for a Pat Martino course. True I wanted, Fire? True Fire. Because that... It's very different when you go and, and, you know, people are not... Of course, like True Fire and that sort of stuff, the, the way they deliver their content is incredible and it's yeah. very, very different than just going to a YouTube channel and and there's a guy going to teach you some stuff. Um, you know... It depends as well. I mean, I, I bought a Robin Ford one, two Robin Ford ones, and the Alan Hines one from True Fire. And I think they were like maybe 40 or $50 each. Mm. Paul's is like 199 euros, I think. Right. So it may be more complete. Mm. One thing I do think when you buy anything, you're more inclined to use it. Yeah. Because you want value it. from it. Yeah. So you're more inclined to engage with it. And I do think exactly what Dan just said. The way that if, if they're asking you to pay for something, the way that it's laid out, and presented is usually in a pretty linear fashion that makes sense in in th that's going to provide you some benefit in what you learn yeah whereas if you're just sort of you know here and there all over different sites over youtube it's not structured mm. if you know exactly what you want to learn yeah. it could work really well yeah i would totally pay for a guitar well, i do absolutely. totally pay for guitar courses yeah absolutely i yeah i think that's the, you know if you know what you want to learn like the Pat Martino course, I'll be studying that for the rest of my life. Yeah, I do, um, I do the Robin Ford Chord Theory. I think it's called Chord Revolutions or something. You know, I don't have a lot of time, but I've been through it once, and then every now and again I'll go back, yeah. and if I get yeah. a couple yeah. of hours here and there, because you get you download it, right? So yeah. you keep the content. And like Dan said, you know, I think I first got that two years ago, and there's mm. still bits of it that I look at. Yeah. So it's, it's evergreen. Yeah, and guys like Paul Davids and uh, Justin Guitar, and, you know, excellent teachers 
Um, so yeah, it's for me, it's totally worth it. Yeah. Brian Mills. Thank you, Brian. There's no question thank there. You, so maybe we've missed you. Um, I think we're going to really struggle to get through these down. Okay. Uh, Ian says, I've just acquired a Bloom version two by Jackson Audio. Nice. Where should it go? My chain, I never know where to put an EQ boost. I have it after fuzz because of the compressor. Okay. Um, depends depends on how you want to use it, but I think an EQ boost is great at the end of a gain stage. At the end of all your gain stages yeah. is where, where I would say stick yeah. it there. If you put it before it, it shapes the overdrive. If you put it at the end, it shapes the overall tone. Yeah. So... You know, we always say, don't we, plug it in, listen to it in different spots and yep. see what works for you. Yep. Um, where would you put it? You'd put it after the gain stages. After the gain stages. Yeah. Yeah. I would de I would also definitely put it after the fuzz, as you say. Yep. Yeah. I'm struggling to decide between a Les Paul and SG and a 335. Each one has its positives and negatives. All I know is that I want some low output PAF love. I'd mm. appreciate, your, appreciate your insight. Uh, on each says Servando Flores. We've got the uh, Les Paul and 335 show happening this Friday. Yeah, so, so watch check that. that out. Also, they vary massively from model to model. So, you know, 1335 doesn't sound like the next yeah, 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 Ergonomics may be a part of it. Um, one of the reasons I struggle with Les Pauls is because they sit there. Mm. They're usually body heavy because they're usually heavy. Mm. And the way that, because it's a single cutaway design, the neck sits back in and they tend to sit back a bit, which some people really love and some people love less. Mm. And the position of the strap buttons. What you get on an SG is the strap buttons on the heel and the body's kind of dinky and the neck sticks out all the way over there. So it'll sit over there a bit. Yeah. And it is, a, it's, it's a whole different thing. You either love it or you don't love it. And it's yeah. one of the, uh, yet another reason why they, the necks flap a bit, but Three through five. Similarly, it's a bigger body all over. Um, the strap button is on the heel again here instead of on the horn and back there. So the, the three through five sits much more in the middle, but it's a physically much bigger guitar. So there might be some um, ergonomic reasons that you prefer one or the other. Tone-wise, let's see. The SG sounds the most direct and in your face and minimum colour. The SG just is, and it's on. Les Paul is a fat version of that. It's slightly more complex. I mean, this is general, generalising, of course. More extended low end. Bloomier. Mm. 335 adds air, adds a bit of mid-scoopiness, bit of honkiness. So... You know, I would listen to some classic recordings down the years of key SG, Les Paul and 335 players and see what tweaks. What you need to end up with is probably two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, just had SG. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one, that. Really tough one. Uh, no, don't hit that button, Nick. Do not hit that button. <gasps> Sorry, you've done such a great job of doing the questions today. I'll just let you add it. Right. How are we doing? We are not doing very well at all. Boy, oh boy. Oh, my God. Um, all right, quick fire round. Yeah, honestly, please, 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 no more super chats because we are really struggling. Um, right, Chris Klein, thank you. Thank Jason Carapazzi. Jason, nice to hear from you. Yeah. You really enjoyed the tones over the weekend. He says, I'm making a new board and I'm planning on a QMX8 to keep all of my drives uh, in clean loops with five or so mod pedals by themselves. Mm. Is this worthwhile to do or do I need a larger QMX or G3 to keep things quiet? Ah. Uh. Uh, it will be great in the QMX8. It will work really well. It just depends on the functionality that you want. You know, QMX8 will, will do it all um, as far as getting things clean and things out of the, out of the signal path. It just, yeah, it all depends on functionality. 
yeah, it's really tough. Having everything in its own dedicated loop it's is nice. the cleanest possible way to do it. Yeah. Uh, how much that actually matters to you is the next question. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I got five pedals on this pedal board down here, no switcher whatsoever. It sounds great. Sounds really good. But it's causing me some tap dancing problems. And every now and again, I'm like, I don't want to hear that noise. I do not want to hear that noise. So it's going to go in the atom. Um, Dennis Ditlevson, Ditlevson, Dennis Ditlevson from Denmark says, Hi guys, I don't have the time to see you live today, he says, but he's been very generous. Oh boy. I love your show. Greetings from Denmark. Greetings oh, to Denmark. You. I love Denmark. Yeah, we just started watching a new Danish uh, murder thing, which is okay. great. They do murder like no one else. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's really good. It's called DNA, I think. Anyway. Um, Tom Bromby says, what do you think about multi-mode delay pedal which combines actual BBD chips as the analog mode with digital processing for other modes? Maybe the automaton delay. Does that exist? The automaton delay? No, no, no. Um, a delay pedal that's got BBD and... Uh, BBD bucket brigade devices, for anyone who doesn't know that. Uh, I don't know one. It's a blooming great idea. Someone ought to be developing that right now. Yeah. Someone was thinking about it. Were they? <laughs> Too late. Dave Oshman. Hi, Dave. Greetings from Houston, Texas. Whenever you talk about less expensive Fender tube amps, you mention the Pro Junior. Do you prefer that to the Blues Junior and why? Um, I. OK, so I own a Blues Junior, mm. but I think I prefer the Pro Junior because mm. it's simpler. Right. The Blues Junior sounds a bit scratchier to me. Mm. Um, and that is just a matter of settings. I'm sure there's a sweet spot in the Blues Junior. Yeah. I, w uh, I'm going to say something ridiculous, like the more controls you put on an amp, the worse it sounds. Which is just not true. No. It's just not true. Yeah. But it's my experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true of my two rock. No, there you go. That's got loads of controls on it. Um, it's a different thing. The, 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 it's a different thing. I, I have definitely have a sort of love-hate relationship with the Blues Junior. Yeah. And I have a love-love relationship with the Pro Junior, but I don't own one. So right. there you read, read into that what you want. The one we had through a Marshall 4x12 at, at Mike's at Analog Man, mm -hmm. that was... Ah, oh, mega. Was great. Look at this, man. 1961. Look how deep that cherry is. Isn't that nice? Sorry, we don't have time. I don't have time for this. It's nice. I enjoyed it. Did you? Yeah. I'd love this guitar. It's got to be the best guitar in in, in the room, isn't it? Yeah, and, but I don't play it that much. No. I just, I need to, yeah, I need to play it more. It's Tom so Snyder, Dan and Mick, thanks always for inspiring my love of all things guitars. If you were going to start collecting vintage pedals, what three pedals would you start with? Okay. Uh, okay, far out. See, nice, yes. Well, I would start personally with a C1 Phase 90 Electric Mistress, yeah. Um, only because vintage modulation are the pedals that I find hardest to get modern equivalents for. You can get great modern fuzzes, great modern drives, um, and not that there aren't great modern. Uh, modulation pedals, but vintage modulation pedals. Yeah, there's the thing that I find hardest to replace. There's, there's. I, I think what he's saying makes total sense. Like, get stuff that's really hard to do now. Yeah, because there's a lot of stuff that's just better now. I mean, most drive pedals are better now. Aren't yeah, they? I'd say, I'd say so. That's um, a fair compliment. You know, certainly yeah, digital compliment. delays and stuff are far more functional. Yeah, but then you can't, you cannot do a tape echo. In digital, you just it can't be done. No, not not to the ultimate standard. Um, so yeah, go for stuff that that is very hard to make. Yep. Now. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm antisocial again. Back to my DC two was a quick question. Yes. Yes. Uh, would an Ebtech LLS two two channel line level shifter work? Or better to put the DC two in a loop with a boost in the front. 
I don't, oh, no, no, don't boost the front of it. That's the the problem with the DC two is 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 yeah. it, it can't handle the input. So your what you're hearing is a level drop. That level drop is it crapping out. It's yeah. not the fact that it's getting quieter. It's yeah. just getting too much signal and yeah. it's going. I can't take this. Yeah. So what you want to do is actually get something that reduces the signal at the input, from and then increases the signal at the output. Yeah. Which is what these. It um, doesn't have enough headroom. Is the problem? No, no. That's the yeah. So it's really not designed to sit in an effects loop. Yeah. Well, we even had it on the end of my pedal board, didn't we? Yeah. And, and when we hit we it hard, it it's on, like, it was yeah, like, no oh. thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, do just check that the two modes don't make a difference. Yeah. Um, um, greetings from Mexico City, says Amori Peña. I've got an amps question. What would you consider better value between a Hot Rod Deluxe 3 and a Supersonic 22? Both are in my budget and available in town. Ooh. That's tough, actually. So Supersonic 22, I guess that uses 6v6s. I don't know. Hot Rod Deluxe is definitely 6L6s. Mm-hmm. I believe the supersonic has got a couple of different modes for the clean channel. So it's yeah. got like a tweed mode and a non-tweed mode, maybe. Right. I, Hot Rod Deluxe is like the, you know, one of the best-selling amplifiers in the world. But I love the supersonic. If you want headroom, if you want more headroom, go for the Hot Rod. Yeah. If you want kind of sweeter, crunchier character, a bit more character, yeah. go for the supersonic. Yep. Yep. Um, David Braniff again. Hi, David. Hey, thanks David. again. He says, thanks, boys, for everything. I got to try a Vox AC-10 for a wet dry wig. <laughs> Before lockdown here in Northern Ireland, I loved it. But my big muff pie was too much. Um, Dan, what are my options? JHS? Um, y yeah. The, the problem that you've got is the bottom end with the pie. So you want a muff that's got bottom end control. So the Thorpey... Um, th uh, fallout cloud into that will just sound superb because you can contour that bottom end down. Yeah. Um, I remember one of the best guitar sounds I ever heard was a a bit it's just a normal big muff into a Vox AC15, and oh man, that was such an an awesome thing. This this. I must have been 16 or 17 at a battle of the bands. Awesome. And, oh, man, he sounded so good. Um, but, yeah, the AC-10 is just not going to handle it. Yeah, so Thorpey Fallout, yeah. Thorpey Fallout Cloud. Thorpey Fallout Cloud. Yeah. Uh, David Burke says, uh, Dr. Z M12 is a 12, one by, 12 watt 1 by 12 combo, now discontinued. Purpose designed as a pedal platform amp with higher headroom. Wow. Um, that sounds really cool. It doesn't sound massively a million miles away from the PR-12 from Morgan. I'm betting that Dr. Z is at uh, EL84 perhaps, and the Morgan's 6L6s? Six or is it no, I think it's 84s. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. I okay. Think. Wow. I don't know. Well, it's based on a Princeton. What's in a Princeton? 6V6s. Oh, okay. In which case? I think. Call me wrong. Uh, Ian McKee. Hey. I've just finished a proper board at the weekend uh, and with Vic P it sounds so much better. There you go. Yes, it does. Um, I thought that would be that, but two days on, I'm scouring <laughs> reverb <laughs> for boutique pedals to swap in. Damn you both. <laughs> Any thoughts on the DSM simplifier? I don't know what that is. Uh, the simplifier, I think, is the uh, the mixer. I think that you put at the end for... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, no thoughts. Um, I'll, I'll have to have a look. Yeah, sorry, don't know. Is it a stereo to minor thing? I'm not sure. Pierre Decamp. Hello, Pierre. Hey, Pierre. He says, hello, mes amis. Bonjour, monsieur. Yeah, that was our Eurovision entry, by the way. Hope you're well. I missed you last week and realised how much this is part of my stay sane in confinement routine. Ah, ours too. Thank you so much for the weekly two hours of fun and sunshine this is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's been... Two and a half hours today. Indeed. And very happy we are too. Matt, again. Matt Boyd, hello. Hey, mate. Hey, guys, I have a question about using OD pedals with the ability to significantly boost level volume into a high headroom amp. Is, yeah, okay. Uh, assuming the amp's preamp can take it, do you like to control the overall volume with the amp or the pedal? Ah, this is really interesting. Great question. Yeah, really interesting. So, both is the answer. Yeah. Um, I, one of the things when I was doing Andy Timmons' rig, 
he has a, a lot of volume, a lot of output coming from his pedals because the way that the amp, his, um, his messes react to signal the input is very special. It, but it's about understanding your amplifier, it's about understanding the, the, gain, the initial gain stage of the amp and, and what that's, you know, how that reacts to loads of signal being pushed into it. Um, so try having the amp turned up, the output of your gain stage turned down, and then finding an acceptable level, then do the opposite, turn the amp down, turn the input of the, the output of the pedal up to the same volume level yeah. and feel the difference with that. Um, so like one thing with the matchless, it loves being sm like punched really hard yeah. at the input. Absolute, just I think eats it up. Dan and I would probably agree that our favorite place for any amp is where it's kinda, if you hit it as hard as possible with a guitar, it just gives. Yeah. But then if you slam a load of pedal in the front of it, it's giving much more. Yeah. So you do get a lift. You definitely get a lift. Yeah. But you don't get the same lift that you would get if you had like endless clean headroom. Yeah. It's really that combination of the amp giving and the pedal giving its flavour. Yeah, exactly. To, to me anyway, yeah. that is where the most inspiring guitar tones to play are, because yep. then you get the feel and all that stuff. And where that sweet spot is is different from amp to amp. It's yep. different with the pedals and like yeah. So it's it's taking the time with your. You, know, you get used to your pedals as they are, and you go, oh, what I need is a new amp. You get the new amp, you plug it, and you're like, wow, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. all my pedals sound rubbish. Yeah. And it's just not that. It's the different headroom characteristic of the amp. So it's a fine balance of amp volume, pedal volume, how much lift you want. Yep. How much lift you don't want. Yep. And yeah, that's part of the fun of it, isn't it? Totally. And as Dan alluded earlier, the relationship in those gain textures are, can be radically different. Totally. Uh, as a bassist who plays guitar, says Scott McLean, um, I would love for you guys to get a guest to talk about bass pedals. Before lockdown happened, we had um, Paul Turner um, coming in. So Paul Turner from Jamiroquai is a very good friend of mine uh, who is an absolute master of bass pedals. Um, but he was he was also going to come in um, with Rob Harris, the guitar player, and their drummer, and we'll talk about rhythm sections and and the effects being used and stuff like that. And those guys doesn't get any better than that. So yeah, it was part of the plan. We will do that as soon as we possibly can. Leyland pedals. I think I need a super reverb after Friday. I yeah. wanted to say you've inspired and taught me and others a lot, enough to start my own pedal thing. Oh my word, well I, done. I bought some stuff from the TPS store today. Can I send a pedal or two as a thanks? Really okay, if not, of course you can. Um, send us an email and we'll we'll work it out. Yep, just... And, and good luck, you know. Yeah, good luck, mate, that's uh, well done. It's not a small undertaking to get into this caper. No. <clears throat> Um, and thanks for buying stuff from the store. Makes big difference. Well, it makes all the difference to us. Flow, the inner game of tennis, says Chris Collins' guitar. Yeah, man. Back to you. Um, hi, gents. I lucked into a Kingsley Constable. What's a good drive pedal? Think 90s alternative. I like Klon style. Also, low gain, low gain fuzz for a Les Paul, says Chris Morgan. Okay, so for anyone who doesn't know, Kingsley Constable is... Uh, the front end of a Marshall Plexi, kind of. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so just think anything that sounds good into a, a, a Plexi. 90s alternative, you really need uh, a big muff. Big muff, absolutely. Fuzz. Yep. Um, and you like a clon style, so get the J-Rocket Archer. Yep. There you go, get Perfect. a big muff and a J-Rocket Archer. Not much you can't do with that. Awesome. Yep. Yep, awesome. I'm very excited for my G3, says you put your small combos on. Thanks as always, guys. You're um, talking oh, about small combos now. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They're actually just bits of our rigging truss. They're just bits of our yes um, stage truss that holds the studio up. So um, we don't use specific stands. They're just these little three-pronged bits of truss. Uh, there are some cool amp stands out there, actually. Yeah, um, I've got a couple, but I... Uh, my problem with that, I like them on the floor, that's the trouble. Yeah. I like the way they sound on the floor. I th yeah, so 
I bought a couple to try some different things and ended up going back to just sticking them on the floor. Well, I can be really loud. There was someone did a, like a molded thing which you stick it on and then it, it acts as a base port. Okay. Like, do you remember when all that mad stuff happened in the 70s, like weird shaped drums? And it sort of felt a bit like that. I right. bet it works. I bet it works. Yeah. Uh, Matt, uh, Shaft Johnson Shaft Johnson says you've inspired me to set up a wet dry rig so I picked up a 64 Bandmaster blimey yeah, to run with my JTM 45 I've ordered a belly pop deluxe and a 74 phase 90 <laughs> I'm new to delay in phases but no half measures yeah that sounds pretty special awesome note of interest Dave G says Brian Garcia used an HM2 through the 80s live and on, uh, on songs like Sorrow and on the turning away, many uses outside metal. If boosted with a muff, HM2 gives treble and mids. That's really interesting. Wow. That's really interesting. So David Gilmore of the popular beat combo Pink Floyd is a uh, fan of the Boss Heavy Metal 2. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Yep. Um, tuning issues. Fender versus Gibson. I feel like Strats and Tellys. I can beat up like a quality SUV, mm. whereas my Gibson stuff is like fine luxury vehicle that I can't take off road. But it's amazing to drive, says Bruce Wilkins. Yeah, that's it. That's that's that is interesting. It, um, change with guitar, guitar. I this has more of a you know the, the thing with you know the, the loads neck. of people on the internet just went no. <laughs> um, you know I can get a lot of movement. Well, there's you know, tuning and there's intonation, isn't there? Yeah, and I guess a lot of that's me going, pushing harder and harder as I'm pulling back on the Does neck. it stay in tune? This does, oh yeah. yeah. This is amazing for staying in tune. I've had, SG, I've had Les Pauls that just will not stay in tune and yeah. an SG that literally was impossible to stay in tune. It's always the nut. It's always right. the tuners. Yeah. And it's always the bridge. And if you have them breathed on by people who know what they're doing, they, are, they can be rock solid too. Yeah. That gold top is the steadiest tuning Gibson really? I have yeah. ever played right my 335 too I can hammer that through a queen gig and it it is fine so I think you know nut you've got that back angle over the thing it's a nightmare but they do they can they can be rock solid Joe Brian Massa ever seen him play a Les Paul blimey O'Reilly yeah uh, pistons and petrol I run a pair of 20 watt marshals in a stereo rig I've realised I really love the sound of blending one side with a big muff set at two and the other side at ten. How can I incorporate this into my rig? Um, uh, so you want you want the separate signals going to your separate amps. Yeah, that's if, tough. You need two parallel effects yeah, lines. Yeah, well, yeah. If you split the signal, go into the, the big muffs and then to the amplifiers. Now, the tricky thing with that is you know, if you want effects after that, you need to make sure that you have a, they have a true stereo signal pass. So, um, you know, if you're going to use stereo delays and reverbs, they've got to be proper stereo delays and reverbs. Um, but yeah, you want to split the signal into the pedals, set them the way you like them, make sure everything's in phase, and then make sure anything's after that is proper stereo. Or um, you want to do like a... Uh, have some effects going to one amplifier so you can have like a phaser just on one side yeah. but just you can run into phase issues and that sort of stuff so just yeah be aware of that but yes yeah, but the signal pedals amps yeah so you need two parallel lines yep. Yep. all the way through don't yep. you yeah uh follow-up question says pierre de comp number one dan how many humdingers can you put in a chain without problem I've can you use two uh, for wet amps in a wet dry wet setup. Uh, yeah, I think we over the show once I had seven yeah. amps, uh, or seven humdingers and eight amps all together. And, it's and that was fine. Sounds okay. Epic. Uh, should you isolate the signal going into an active DI? Uh, should you isolate the signal going into an active DI? The active DI should have isolation on it. Yeah, depends on the active DI, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. How about building a CUDA caster, says Rolf Martin Halderson. Uh, and I'm also still waiting for that Rack Effects show. 
Thanks for keeping us sane. Mm. Um, Rise Cudicaster was up for auction, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, 150 grand. 150 or grand. Start, was the... start price, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't. I, it's such a great. What a cool guitar. I would mm. have no idea what to do with it. Yeah. Wish I could play slide. Yeah. Hey, I boys. To the set, this, I remember when I first heard him, it was on the soundtrack to Cocktail. That, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom Cruise film. Tom Cruise film. Yeah. And the soundtrack to that thing is unbelievable. Yeah. It's a crazy guitar playing. As the, remember that film Roadhouse with uh, oh, yeah, Judge with that, Reinhold and... Uh, what's his face? Um, Roadhouse is Patrick Phil. Swayze. Phil McCafferty. <laughs> no, that's your <laughs> mate. Um, what's his name? The, the blind guitar player who would... Jeff Healy. Jeff Healy, yeah. yeah. Ah, he, he was something else. Quite man. the soundtrack on that one. Anyway, um, <laughs> John William Gould says, Hey boys, I just got a Tech 21 Roto Choir after A being every Leslie pedal I could find. For sure, it's the most authentic sounding. Check it out if you can. Okay. Um, side note, what pedal is great for boosting a broken up amp? A Klon? Yes. Yes, totally. Klon works with everything. Yeah. And it's particularly good for breaking amps because it drops off a bit of bass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has a particular upper mid push that is just, it just works with everything. Yeah, it's a 1K push, which is a little bit higher than a Tube Screamer. Yeah. But also it doesn't dull the top end. doesn't kill the treble. Yeah. There's a lot of people who've got clons over the years, plugged them into amps and gone, well, I don't get this at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it it, it really, it's, its job is as a pusher. Yep. Uh, no question, says Jaden Wiggins. Uh, just a hello and a Merry Christmas from oh, Tasmania, Australia. My shoes come from Tasmania, Australia, although I rather suspect they're made in China. Uh, right. Um, how are we getting on, Dan? How are we getting on? Was that yes, it? Yes, one left. Okay, well done, mate. Plexico says, I've given you some money just to have Dan and Nick say happy holidays to me. Oh, bless you. So happy holidays to you, Plexico. Yes, happy holidays, Plexico. And to everybody else. Indeed. Yep, whether you celebrate it or not. Yep. Greetings of, of the season and glad tidings and wellness to indeed. everybody. Indeed, indeed. We d we've decided that after many years of not doing a Christmas show, we're going to do a Christmas show this year. We are. We did a Christmas show. It took ages and a lot of effort, and nobody watched it. It was the worst viewed show we had in... Yeah, to be fair, we didn't have much of an audience then, so that might explain that. So we're going to do it again. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh. OK, everyone, thank you so much back. for joining us. Uh, see, this is stools. You've got to have this... I guess you can lean on your laptop. Um, take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Please do. And um, have a great week. Uh, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We do. Yeah. We do. It's nice to... Uh, I feel better than I did when we started. Good. And that's saying something. Good. Good. Um, yeah. Have a great week. Show on this Friday. Uh, 335 versus Les Paul. Fun, fun, fun. Yeah. It's not a real question. No, it's not. It's just for the clickbait. It is. It is. <laughs> Cheerio. All right. Buddy. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye.